staff over staff staff testing one two one two mic mic check mic check one staff are we ready welcome to the city county planning commission the members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the Board of County Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have a final say on any issue before us tonight. If you wish to speak on an agenda item tonight, please go to the table to my left and sign up to speak. For those who wish to speak, please state your name and your address clearly when you come to the podium. Please speak clearly into the microphone as this is being televised. Each side, those speaking in favor of an item and those speaking in opposition to an item, will have 10 minutes to present for each side. The time will be divided among all persons wishing to speak. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is denied. So April the 12th, the Planning Commission meeting, let's call to order. Could we have the roll call, please? Mr. Bryan. Present. Mr. Busby. Present. Ms. Freeman. Present. Mr. Ghosh. Present. Mr. Gibbs. Mr. Harris. Present. Ms. Huff. Here. Ms. Hyman. Present. Mr. Kinchin. Present. Mr. Miller. Here. Mr. Van. Present. Mr. Whitley. Here. Ms. Winders. Present. And Mr. Gibbs just came in. So with the quorum present, do we have adjustments to the agenda? Um, yes, we do. Grace Smith with the planning department. Um, we sent notice out to you via email, and we also re-noticed or sent notice to the neighborhoods and um, registered neighborhood associations for case 5A North Roxborough Road Retail, case A15-00002, and case Z15-00006 that the applicant requested a deferral until the May 10th regular uh, planning commission meeting that deferral request was um, granted by the planning director so that item will not be heard tonight it will be on the agenda for next month so that's the first adjustment um, actually I don't have another adjustment but I have a couple of other announcements um, of course uh, required notice has been executed in accordance with the UDO standards and all affidavits for notice requirements are on file in the planning department and I would also like to say at this time that we have uh, an announcement that's it's been kind of a gloomy day here in the planning department. We found out that we're gonna lose one of our employees. Um, Ms. Amy Wolf has decided to try something different and she's ch making a change in her career and we're gonna miss her greatly, but I wanted everyone to know that she will not be here next month. So make sure you take a moment to- And tell them what time she, wh when she's leaving. Uh, she'll be gone April 26th. That's okay. her last day in the planning department. So. Okay. But this is her last planning commission meeting. So thank you for indulging me for a minute. Mr. Chair, yes, I have a. I'd like to add an item under new new business. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd like to add an item under new business. Too. Okay. Anything else? If not, the chair will entertain a motion that we adopt the agenda as modified. So moved. Second. Motion and seconded by motion by uh, Commissioner Bryan and seconded by Commissioner Miller that we adopt the agenda as modified. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those in opposition. Okay, unanimous vote. Uh, Approval of the minutes. You receive the minutes with your packet. Are there questions, corrections, omissions? If there's no corrections, the. No, I was just going to make a motion. Okay, I'll take it. Um, Mr. Chair, I move approval of the minutes and the attached consistency statements. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bryant, second by Vice Chair Hyman, that we adopt the minutes with the attached 
attachments along with it. All those in favor, let it be known by showing the right hand. All those in opposition? Unanimous vote. Okay, item five and five A has been moved to next month, so we'll go to item five two, the multifamily A one five triple zero thirteen and Z one five zero quadruple zero six. All right, thank you, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department. I wanted to thank Chair will now open for for a public hearing. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department. I wanted to thank uh, Ms. Smith for her kind words. It's been a pleasure to serve Durham and the community, and uh, I will certainly miss the opportunity. Um, Plan Amendment A150013 for TW55 multifamily is a request from Hopper Communities. It's been reviewed under the city's jurisdiction. This request, along with the rezoning, is part of a um, consolidated land use item that will include an annexation and utility extension agreement uh, when it goes to um, council uh, after this board uh, makes a recommendation. The request is from the present future land use designation of industrial and medium density residential to medium high density residential and the acreage of this request is a total of 17.74 acres. It differs from the zoning request um, by 8.34 acres um, for the site area uh, because there is 8.34 acres of recreation and open space on these three parcels that is not included in the plan amendment. The site, again, is three, a portion of three parcels at 5627 NC 55 Highway uh, at the intersection of NC 55 Highway and TW Alexander Drive. It's in the suburban tier. It is in the FJB watershed protection overlay. About a half mile um, to the north is the suburban transit area associated with the 50, Highway 54 and Highway 55 intersection. A quarter mile to the it's a quarter mile uh, west of a Research Triangle Park, and the uh, southern boundary of Durham County is about an hour to the south. Uh, excuse me, a mile to the south. Uh, <laughs> well, be quite She's a already gone. <laughs> <laughs> Durham is growing. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, the site, again, is a portion of three parcels. Um, 3.66 acres is presently designated as industrial, which is right on the corner of NC55 Highway and TW Alexander Drive. Uh, the portion um, uh, with the future land use map designation of medium density residential, uh, which is six to 12 units an acre, is 14.08 acres. There's four criteria for plan amendments that staff is rev um, reviews. Uh, it's required by the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, whether or not the proposed change would be consistent with the intent, goals, and objectives, policies, and guiding principles and programs of any adopted plans. Criteria B is the proposed change would be compatible with the existing land use pattern and or designated future land uses. Criteria C is um, whether the proposed change would create substantial adverse impacts in the adjacent area or in the city or county in general. And criteria D is whether the subject site is of adequate shape and size to accommodate the proposed change. So in consideration of criteria A for the applicable policies that are listed here and as well as in your staff report, staff has found that these policies are met um, a little more detail. Um, policy 252E, the demand for land uses. Uh, with the proposed change, there'd still be a surplus gap for both industrial and residential. Um, and the uh, water demand generation rates and, imp and the infrastructure capacity. Uh, there are related studies uh, associated with the zoning map change that are mitigated through the zoning map change, um, and the, the water would certainly be considered with the annexation request and utility extension agreement. At this time, um, the preliminary data for the annexation um, uh, would accommodate this request. Further detail will be provided at council. Again, in the context area, there, are, are, there is multifamily development to the east of this project. There is a railroad corridor also uh, on the boundary of the east. Burdens Creek is north of the site. There is a tributary creek, um, feature into Northeast Creek, which runs on the 
uh, west side of NC55 Highway. There's a wastewater treatment facility on the opposite side of NC55 Highway, and it's vacant uh, south of TW Alexander Drive. So uh, given the request for uh, medium high density residential, um, it would extend the existing pattern of development from the east to the west um, and in, uh, provide housing for uh, close to proximity to employment um, associated with RTP and, and the region as a whole. Criteria C, substantial adverse impacts. Um, it, again, it's similar development to the properties already developed in the area. There are um, undeveloped properties. Uh, staff feels this is an extension um, of the multifamily uh, to the east and, um, and, and would not create any substantial um, adverse impacts. Um, it is of adequate shape and size to accommodate residential use in, in, uh, on this property, and staff feels it meets criteria D as well. So in summary, it, it meets the four criteria um, for review under a plan amendment. We have considered that with our re recommendation. Staff recommend, recommends approval based on consideration of adopted plans, compatibility impacts, and site dimensions. And, and again, it's from for 3.66 acres of industrial and 14.08 acres of uh, medium density residential to uh, medium high density residential. That concludes the staff amendment, uh, excuse me, the staff report for the plan amendment, the zoning map change, which is associated with this request, is as follows. Case Z1500032. Um, in this case, the applicant is technically the city of Durham since it's associated with an initial zoning related to an annexation through the request of Eden's Lamb Court. We have reviewed this under the city's jurisdiction and the request is from commercial neighborhood and residential rural to residential suburban multifamily with a development plan. The site is 26.08 acres. It's the same three parcels as the plan amendment but it also includes the recreation and open space area. And the proposed use is for 192 to 300 multifamily units, and that multifamily is a committed um, housing type. Again, 5627 NC 55 Highway at the intersection of NC 55 Highway and TW Alexander Drive. Um, it is south of Burdens Creek. Um, there's commercial neighborhood along the frontage of the property along NC 55 Highway, residential rural to the rear. Um, Again, it's the same context as the plan amendment, and it is presently in the county with consideration for annexation um, following the recommendation of this board. The development plan and the request meets the minimum standards for the residential suburban multifamily district. Uh, the site is presently uh, undeveloped. Uh, there's a uh, riparian feature through the center of the site and associated floodway, um, excuse me, uh, floodplain. Um, this is a tributary to Northeast Creek through the site. Burdens Creek is to the north, um, but it's, the site is, tr is forested. The development plan associated with this request shows two building and parking envelopes. One, um, the north is to the left for orientation. So one to the north of the uh, riparian feature, one to the south. Uh, commitments on this development plan are the tree coverage areas, the possible stream crossing, that is something that's required to be identified at the stage of application, and then there's three access points, one to NC55 Highway, one to TW Alexander Drive, and uh, one to the north. Commitments of this plan are the intensity at, at a um, density of 8.000, to 12.506 dwelling units per acre, which would yield 192 to 300 units. There's one potential stream crossing. There's three site access points. Impervious surface maximum would be 70%, which is the maximum for the FJB protection water, watershed protection area, and tree coverage at 20%. Graphic commitments are the location of the access points, tree preservation, and building and parking envelopes. There's several commitments with this request. Uh, this development will be multifamily residential uses, um, construct a bus pullout and concrete pad shelter, an additional four feet of asphalt along TW Alexander Drive for, to allow for a bicycle lane, eastbound left turn lane on TW Alex 
Alexander Drive at site access number one and northbound right turn lane at NC 55 Highway and site access number two. The request is not consistent with the future land use map. You've just heard the report for that. They are requesting a future land use density that would accommodate the proposed density on this zoning, which is medium high density residential. Staff is recommending approval of that. Um, the, this request does satisfy and meet the standards of the other comprehensive plan policies that apply to the site. And staff determines that should the plan amendment be approved, this request would be consistent with the future land use map of the comprehensive plan and other adopted plans and ordin ordinances. And staff is available for any questions. Thank you. I have one person signed up to speak. Are there other members in the audience wishing to speak to this item? Okay, I have one member speaking in favor, Jared Eaton. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land Corp. I'm here representing my client, uh, Hopper Communities. Uh, before I begin, just a quick note about Amy. I know we used to have protest petitions where you could oppose a rezoning. I would like to start a protest petition that opposes <laughs> Amy leaving the city. I think everybody in this room would sign. I'll sign that. All right. I appreciate it. Uh, Amy's been great to work with. Really appreciate it. I hate to see you go. So I just want to, and I'm not buttering up to her because she's leaving. So I really feel this way. Anyways, um, just to summarize Amy's report of the project, we've got about 26 acres. Uh, you've got a land use amendment and a rezoning being proposed for multifamily development. We don't know at this time what the, the final product's gonna be. It's, to, it's laid out to where it would support townhomes and or apartments or a combination of both. Uh, there's no end user for the site at this time, so we're just trying to get the, the zoning out of the way now. As you heard, we have staff support of both of our requests. Uh, we did perform a traffic study for this project. Uh, this parcel is sort of unique and the adjacent roadways have uh, significant extra capacity beyond what's currently traveling on TW and, and 55, but we did complete the study that was approved by DOT in the city. Uh, we got a couple of roadway improvements as part of that study. Uh, we did have a neighborhood meeting back in July of last year, um, very small attendance. We have no opposition that I'm aware of. And just in general, we feel this is a good location for, for multifamily and a little bit more denser development with access to 55 and TW and being so close to RTP. Uh, so again, I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any other members of the audience wishing to speak? If not, we will close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Do we have commissioners wishing to speak? And I'm looking directly at you, Linda. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, Commissioner Huff. Okay, um, this is for Jared, I think. Um, what happens to this area here that's uh, on the future land use map that is determined to be open space? What happens to that in this rezoning? Because it looks like it's a lot more than the part that you say is not developable. Well, I believe that that line follows, I don't have the map in front of me, that, that line follows the floodplain limits, the recreation open space designation we're not proposing to making changes to that okay um so you're going to develop on <coughs> each side of the this uplands area yeah it just looks like the numbers here uh, it, it doesn't look like they match up because it says um um side area let's see uh side area within you, the, the gross area is 26 acres, and the developable area is what, 23? Is almost 24, so that would be, that's only two acres, that area? It, it just looks like more Well, the 23.99, the because it, the, the state recently passed legislation where the, the stream buffer portion of the floodplain area now counts towards density. Ah. So technically, that counts as developable area. It's still area. buffer, but it counts toward density. Correct. Gotcha. And I think okay. that was around three acres or so, three or four acres that's in the stream buffer. I know we worked with Amy on this. Uh, I, I can confirm that. We did work um, through that um, 
calculation a couple times given this uh, legislature change and uh, the applicants and pr property developers now have uh, can get credit for the riparian mm -hmm. buffer features they're still protected but they get the density credit for those right I, I, it just is because you're looking at the you're looking at a drawing here and it didn't look like it matched up with the numbers the other question I have is about this you're gonna I don't see how you can not build a some sort of stream crossing here I mean it was uh, look like you're gonna need houseboats in that <laughs> no, we, I mean we do have a the arrow to the north yeah. is we do have a stream crossing identified. We just have it located outside of the floodplain. Uh huh. But we will have a stream crossing. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Goosh. Uh, I just wanted to say, well, first of all, uh, I plan on voting in favor of this project. I grew up in this area. Uh, when I was a kid, I passed by this site all the time, and uh, I live there now. So I pass by it basically every day. Um, is be, I cannot understand how this site has not yet been developed, so I'm excited to see that something's going there. Um, I, and as always, you know, uh, Durham is growing, and so I'm excited that it's going to be a residential opportunity for people wanting to move to Durham. That's pretty much all I have to say about it. Um, looks like a good project. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan. Thank you. I have a question for the applicant. Um, your site plan or development plan rather doesn't show sidewalks. There's a comment in here from the Bike Ped Commission about needing sidewalks and I think sidewalks are required. So the question is will there be sidewalks? Yes, there. I don't think we've had a development plan yet that, that showed sidewalks on the development plan because that's required by code and generally we only show the required items on a development plan or something that's above and beyond the code requirement but at site plan uh, I'm sure we'll be asked to install sidewalk along the frontage on 55 and TW and okay. that's what we'll do thank you Commissioner Puxby. Great, thank you mr. chair uh, the first question would be for staff I'm not sure if it's Ms. Wolf or mr. judge I, I just wanted to hear from staff the uh, the reasoning behind the unresolved transportation concern that's mentioned on page five of the zoning map change report and, and it talks about a second crossing yes uh, bill judge with transportation um, that request was due to the uh, the need at stream crossing in order to serve the the northern portion of the property for public safety and circulation uh, the ordinance has a requirement that no more than 90 units but it's defined as external points of access. This is sort of a unique project because they have the two external points of access to TW Alexander and uh, NC55, they, they'll meet that requirement. But um, our concern was that if they developed more than 90 units north of that crossing, that if anything ever happened where that crossing had to be taken out of service for, for some period of time, that there'd be a public safety issue with that many units on the, on the north side. So we had requested a basically a, a text commitment to sort of address that and they were unable to do it but so it it otherwise meets the ordinance so that's why it was listed as an unresolved transportation concern great thank you very much and and just to follow up for mr. Edens I'd just like to hear from your perspective why you felt you weren't able to meet this uh, this request Well, and and Bill said it otherwise meets the ordinance I mean it does meet the ordinance the, the current plan does meet the ordinance there's nothing on here that do, that doesn't meet the ordinance so uh, even at site plan, if we propose the one stream crossing with 100 units on the other side of the stream or 85 or whatever it is, it'll be approved because it meets the ordinance requirements. Um, we didn't want to, it's sort of an, you, you, an ongoing battle in Durham. It, floodplain in Durham is, Durham really tries to protect floodplains, but then we have some issues where people want us to impact floodplains and build roadway crossings and things like that. And I just didn't think in this case it was warranted. Uh, going to council and getting a special approval to impact a floodplain for a crossing that's not required by code. So that's why we decided not to do it. Uh, Commissioner Winders. Well, I had some uh, concerns. I started off with the, with the uh, trans unresolved transportation issue um, thinking about this and um, uh, it 
it seems to me that that is a large piece of very environmentally sensitive area there. And um, to get that many units on the rest of it, of course, we, we now know that everything is completely clear cut. So there will be silt going into, uh, into Northeast Creek and, and various uh, uh, wildlife and, and uh, 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 flowers and things are, will, will be uh, uh, damaged by this. Uh, I don't think that it's um, a really good place for the, uh, a lot of residential development since it's got a sewage treatment plant on one side of it and a railroad on the other side. And I can't, I don't think it's going to be a very good quality uh, development to have many houses packed into the non flood plain part of this development. And uh, then, then um, with the inability to make, uh, and about the sidewalks, I also asked uh, Mr. Judge by email about sidewalks, and um, at so, uh, I understand that at the site plan level, they will be required to either um, uh, add a sidewalk, which is terribly needed uh, in this situation. Uh, as I watch people try to walk up and down Route 54 with no sidewalks, and 55 is a much larger road and is a much bigger problem uh, when people are in apartments and the bus goes by there and everything, you know, uh, we really need the sidewalks and I think we really need a commitment to have a sidewalk, not a payment in lieu. Um, and the payment in, in lieu, um, I don't know whether it's adequate for, for the city to build a sidewalk or not, but the sidewalk might not go in that place, it seems to me, so I would feel a lot better if it, uh, if, if the development was less density, I think it should be the density of the, of the, 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 the part uh, to the, the apartments across the railroad, the orange color rather than the, than the uh, brown color that is being requested in the plan amendment and would be more compatible to the neighborhood and better for the, uh, the environmental um, sensitive nature of this open space part and then we need to have a commitment uh, to to have the sidewalks so i'm voting against it okay but let me get okay uh would you like to respond to her sure um what well, regarding the sidewalk again this I bet if you go back and look at all the previous development plans that have come before the commission, I, I doubt sidewalk is ever shown because it's required a site plan. So I don't know why this project would be different from all the other development plans that you guys review and approve. The payment in lieu that the city puts in place is, is very costly. Um, I have not applied for a payment in lieu that I can remember in the last 10 or 12 years in the city of Durham for sidewalk. I just can't remember doing it because it's a very costly item and it's always cheaper to try to build the sidewalk. We have every intention of, of building the sidewalk here. I didn't want to make a commitment. If, if I ran into a five-foot section somewhere because of floodplain or topography that I can't build, you know, five feet out of 3,000 feet or whatever, I'm not about to commit today to doing whatever it takes to build that five-foot section when I haven't designed the sidewalk yet. It would be crazy for me to do so. So all I can tell you is we'll meet the code requirements, and that's why you see sidewalks in Durham all over the place that right now lead to nowhere because every time something gets developed, the sidewalk has to be constructed. Uh, another comment also about the environmental protection, the, the comment that sediment is going to enter these areas, that's just, that's just an assumption. I mean, there's nothing behind that. We have to control our sediment with our stormwater. We have to install stormwater ponds, and if they're installed correctly, there won't be sediment entering this area. So I don't know what that was based off of, but if we do it the right way, I, it's not gonna happen. I can tell you that's based off the uh, experience with the Parkwood Lake. This is not Parkwood Lake. The I I'm not the engineer the on Parkwood Lake. I'm, I have nothing to do with Parkwood Lake. Commissioner Freeman. So I just, on the traffic side, I was trying to piece it together and understand. So I know that the second entrance or driveway entrance 
would be, will, I guess, is it changing or is it the same at level C? Um, hold on, I think it's in its own name. The uh, both, uh, both, dri both proposed driveways, the NC-55, well, well, the driveway to NC-55 will operate at level C, both in the morning and the uh, PM peak. The driveway to TW Alexander will operate at the level service B in the morning and a C in the, in the PM peak. So, okay. And that C, is that? So, uh, D is our threshold. Uh, D is acceptable. Anything D or better is, is considered acceptable. So this, the C is B and C are both acceptable. Okay. And it's not changing from B to C because of uh, this? N no, because they are, um, well, they, the intersections don't currently exist since at the two proposed driveways. And uh, the other intersection they looked at was NC-55 and TW Alexander, and that's not changing. It's staying the okay. same okay. in the AM and with build out. Okay. And then also, I, I just wanted to ask um, Mr. Edens if they had conversation with any of the community around this annexation case. I mean, we had a neighborhood meeting where we talked about the zoning, the land use amendment, and the annexation, uh, but only two people showed up, and one of those people works for Durham County. Okay. He was just there, happened to be there. And I, I just have to say, I'm, I'm, my main concern in this is that I know that RTP is starting to add residential units, and this site is right along 55, and I know you said that you don't have an end user in mind, um, but I don't want to miss an opportunity to create um, a density affordable housing bonus in addition to any other um, options for affordability along 55 and um, I don't see the reason to move from six to eight units and I mean if there's no end user I'm, I'm trying to understand why right. we're doing this well, it's now. It's currently six to twelve okay. and we're applying for eight to twenty but we're capping it at twelve point five. So in, in reality, we're applying for 8 to 12.5 because the zoning conditions cap it at 12.5. Um, I mean, again, I'm biased, obviously. I think density here on, on a bus route near Major Employment Center makes sense. Uh, I'm not sure why it wouldn't. But if there was a possibility to go from 12.5 to 24.5, you don't see the reason to hold on a little bit longer? No. I'm not sure I understand the 24. We can't go, once this is approved, we can't go over 12 and a half an acre. Exactly. Right, which is a max of 300, which your typical apartment project is about 300 units. I have a couple more questions, but I can wait there. Okay, go on. Um, and then I know um, Commissioner Winders mentioned the sewage treatment facility. How close is that to the property? Yeah, it's directly across the street. Um, the funny thing about that is before someone moves here, they're going to know that the sewage plant is there. You know, we can't force people to move there. So they're going to move there. They know it's there. And if it's an issue for those people, they won't buy there. That's how that will play out. Do you know what the current, yeah. the current medium housing prices are in that area right now? I have no idea, honestly. Uh, my client did go to Talus Management who manages three of the single family properties west of the sewage plant to find out if there were any odor issues and things like that. They've had no reports at Talus Management. You know, developers don't just throw money out willy nilly and just hope that it works out. They tend to do their homework before we get to this point. So uh, we don't feel that the sewage plant is going to be an issue and that's why we're moving forward. Okay. I think I have one more for staff. Just on the It was in the, the, I'm the, um, sorry, the, give me a second. I wrote all my notes in the document, I'm sorry. I can okay. come back. Can. We will come back to you, Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Help me understand how the development plan works here. 
when we when the development plan says potential stream crossing location does that mean what does that mean that that's the only stream the word potential makes it sound like it's optional it is it is an optional um, without having that identified on the development plan a, a crossing would not be permitted if the applicant sought that crossing at the site plan stage. So identifying a potential stream crossing, which is the language specifically calls out in the UDO um, for development plans mm -hmm. to use that word potential stream crossing. The developer um, at site plan is not required to pursue that. However, it gives them the option to pursue it should their ultimate design require it. If they wanted to put it somewhere other than where it's indicated, could they do it? Um, there's typically um, a director's discretion on on general location bit. of it. So, you know, it's a scale drawing, but that is typically not a specific um, dimensioned uh, access point. There is some discretion on that, but generally r right where it's shown. All right, thanks. Yeah. And Jared, I wanted to ask you, what device would you use to make a stream crossing there because that is an exceptionally wet, swampy, low area. As a matter of fact, it's kind of hard to determine exactly where the stream is. Would you put like a causeway with a culvert or you're not, that would be a very long bridge. Yeah, I mean, at this early stage, I wouldn't know. I mean, it, it depends on the drainage area to that point. So if it's small enough, it would be a, just a standard, you know, 48 inch or 60 inch corrugated metal pipe crossing Mm -hmm. If it's much larger, you know, we've used box culverts on other projects that have really large crossings, but without knowing the drainage area to but it. But it would be some sort of raised drive Yeah, you would have there. you would have something to carry the stream mm -hmm. with fill over top of it. But not a bridge structure with pylons or that no, would be unlikely. It, yeah, financially, I don't think that could be supported. But that would all, that has to get permitted, um, I think through the city as well. I mean, we have a certain a limited amount of stream that we can impact with the crossing. And as far as the location goes, Tom, just going back, you were talking to, if you go just, just west of that, that's where you hit the floodplain. So we're not going to be proposing anything that impacts the floodplain. So that arrow may move five, 10 feet to the north or south of where it's at, but it's going to be in that corridor. But th that means where it is. Yeah. All right. Because I don't see how you could do it hardly anywhere else. I yeah, and you, and you want to cross it at, at the highest point of the stream you can because you've got the less, least amount of drainage area and it should be the most shallow stream. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Freeman, you have a question to gather? Commissioner uh, Gibbs. Well, <clears throat> most of my questions have been asked and answered. Uh, uh, but <clears throat> just a comment, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, <clears throat> when a developer goes into a place, I'm sure uh, they, the number of units that they put in or plan for, uh, they take into account what's going to be surrounding and the saleability or marketability of, of these things. But that, that was just a comment. My question is, I missed... <clears throat> Amy's uh, <clears throat> statement on the location of the bus stop and how many there were, uh, could you tell me? And I, and I think the way the condition is written is we, we're committing to providing one if data requests one at the site plan stage, but we don't have the location identified. Maybe, maybe Bill, you can help me out on that. But. So <clears throat> there is bus service out here and I, well, correct. It's similar. It's, uh, we had an apartment project on 54 at Barbie that the board approved a year or so ago with a similar comment. We got the site plan data said this is where we need it. And then we designed it at the site plan stage. Sure. So okay. if they request it, we had to provide it. Okay. Uh, that's, that's something that I think uh, goes along with our plans for mass transit and this area especially, uh, the way the RTP is growing. But uh, thank you, that's, that's my question. I appreciate it. Commissioner Freeman. Just um, to staff, 
Is there a, any tool that you use or could use to assess affordability in a community um, like the medium home price and a development before it comes before us? Okay, Commissioner Freeman, could you speak into the mic I'm so sorry. the people can hear you at home? Um, at this time, we have provided some data um, for our compact neighborhood tiers or those potential areas. I'm not aware that we have that level of information for other areas that um, propose residential development. Um, we do have, there has been an effort and we've provided those numbers in our compact neighborhood tiers because of, of other studies that have gone on, but I, I'm not aware of anything um, uh, countywide that could provide that. And I'm, I'm only mentioning it because I do recognize that this is probably the start of the Research Triangle Park developments around the county. Sure. And being able to track what the changes are ahead of time, you mm -hmm. know, like from the beginning is probably a good idea to get started now. I'll say we'll take a look at that, but as you heard, um, it may not I be a we. Um, but um, I will bring that back to staff and, and uh, <laughs> let your uh, comment be known. Thank you. <laughs> and then just one more comment or question, Mr. Edens. Um, can you actually determine the viability of a development without an end user in place? Well, it's the development plan allows two uses, townhomes and apartments. And so you've got a range of unit count. You've got between uh, 192 and 300. If it's developed at 192, that's going to be townhomes. If it's developed at 300, that's going to be apartments. So we have, a, we have a general idea of what the yield will be with either scenario. Each scenario has a certain value assigned to it, and then we just go from there. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Huff. Um, this is a question for staff. Um, the stormwater remediation in this uh, case, can it be in this floodway fringe? Can it be where? I mean, this is a very wet site. <laughs> Forgive us, we were conferring on that. Um, the, we don't get to that level of design typically at the zoning stage. I know that um, we have various staff who sometimes come to these meetings who have that information, uh, who deal with that on a regular basis. It is my belief um, that stormwater facilities cannot be in a, in a floodway. Um, However, it's, we don't, and it's addressed at site plan um, according mm -hmm. to how it's designed, but I'm not aware of what that criteria is. Okay. Anyone else? Just a comment. Uh, <clears throat> you don't expect to have to use pilings, do you? <laughs> pilings. It's not that wet, is what I'm. Oh, at. I, I'm not a geotech engineer, so I. I don't know. Okay. Chair, may I? I wanted to correct a statement I made. Um, we, uh, I have been corrected that there are situations where those facilities can be in riparian areas, um, but that is assessed at site plan, and I don't have specific information on that, so I do apologize for misspeaking. Okay. Chair, we'll entertain a motion if all comments have been heard. Uh, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Bryan. I move approval of uh, plan amendment case A1500013. Second. second. Motion by Commissioner Bryant, second by <laughs> Reverend Whitley. <laughs> uh, that we approve A1500013. Uh, are you comfortable with sure hands? Would you like roll call? Roll call, please. Okay. So, will you call the roll? Mr. Ghosh? Yes. Mr. Busby? Aye. Mr. Bryan? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Ms. Huff? Yes. Ms. Freeman? No. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Kinchin? Yes. 
Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Van? Yes. Mr. Whitley? Yes. Ms. Winders? No. The motion carries 11 to 0. I'm sorry, 11 to 2. We'll take 11 to zero. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we will now have no. a public hearing. I'm sorry, that was just oh, for the sorry, amendment. Okay. Mr. Chair, I move approval of rezoning case Z1500032. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bryan, second by Commissioner Bugsby that we approve Z1500032. Roll call, please. Ms. Winders? No. Mr. Whitley? That'll be a yes. Yes. M Mr. <laughs> Van? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Kinchin? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Freeman? No. Ms. Huff? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Ghosh? Yes. Mr. Busby? Aye. Mr. Bryan? Yes. And Mr. Whitley? Yes. Motion carries 11 to 2. Okay, at this time we will open the public hearing for Witherspoon Garrett Road, A1500023. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Amy Wolf at the Planning Department. For Garrett, uh, Witherspoon Garrett Road, case A1500023. The applicant is Culture Jewel Thames, PA. This a site is in the city's jurisdiction and it is from the present uh, future land use designation of office and recreation and open space to low density residential. Uh, the site is 4.58 acres. And um, you, you've probably read the staff report. This is somewhat of a complicated case, so bear, bear with, uh, with us on this um, as we try to explain this. And, and, staff is available for your questions at the end. This is one parcel at 4800 Garrett Road. It's between uh, US 15501 Highway and Old Chapel Hill Road. Um, um, I have to make a correction from both staff reports related to this item. I had indicated that there is a, a dan previous dance studio on this side. That is actually the parcel to the north. The, the site was currently owned by a uh, uh, it's owned by a place of worship so it was used from from a place of worship not the dance studio as referenced um, the site is in the suburban tier um, there is natural inventory on a portion of the site it is not in a watershed protection overlay and the site has the designations of 4.2 acres of office and 0.3 acres of recreation and open space there's four criteria of a plan amendment that staff um, looks at when uh, making a recommendation. As, as mentioned in the previous case, um, whether or not it's consistent with policies, objectives, goals, guiding principles, and um, programs of adopted plans. Uh, criteria B is related to the existing and future land use patterns. Criteria C is um, if the proposal would create substantial uh, adverse impacts uh, to the area, adjacent area or city or county in general, and criteria D, B, D, whether the site can accommodate the proposed change. For criteria A, the applicable policies, we looked at the, um, the comprehensive plan policies listed. Uh, it met most of them. The, um, it does not meet the first one, policy 2.1.3B, uh, recreation and open space divined. Basically, the 0.3 acres of recreation and open space on the site is a, mapped as a special flood hazard area, so staff cannot support um, the request meeting this policy. This, the 
request does satisfy the remaining policies. Um, it, the request uh, removes the office designation. Um, there's no guidance on, on whether or not we remove this. The office uses as a transition is in relation to an adjacent commercial use. There's no adjacent commercial here. Uh, so removing office is, is not, um, does not uh, cause any policy concerns. And the demand for land use uses, the remaining, by removing the four acres of office, uh, it still projects a surplus, so we have no concern there. And certainly adding residential um, w could be accommodated in our future land use map, and this is where it starts to get confusing, because as we know, the related zoning map change does commit to an agricultural use. Um, we are um, evaluating this on the um, residential uh, future land use change um, and acknowledging that there are committed uses on the zoning map change. Um, uh, however, our, our recommendations are based on um, changing it to a, a residential use. So uh, for criteria B, um, fitting in with the existing area and the, the existing uh, land use patterns and the proposed future land use patterns and um, development. Again, the site uh, has a, a structure on it for, uh, that was used uh, from a place of worship, not the dance studio. Um, it is, it, it, so it has the building and associated parking. Uh, most of that development is kept towards the eastern portion of the site. Um, creating, uh, changing this site to low density residential um, for a non-residential use uh, is similar to the existing non-residential use, although we do acknowledge that commitments on the development plan do um, appear to make it uh, more intense, um, but it, uh, the, the residential at this location uh, is re uh, reasonable. Criteria C, uh, the proposed change to the future land use designation would allow similar development to the properties developed in the area that was um, the non-residential uses in the area. Um, as the zoning commits to, um, there are residential uses in the area as well. Um, so it, it, it does fit in with the patterns. Criteria D, it is of adequate shape and size to accommodate uh, the proposed use. Uh, so it meets the four criteria of plan amendments with the exception of not meeting policy 3.1.3B to keep recreation and open space the category for the map special flood ha hazard area. And staff recommends denial based on consideration of adopted plans, compatibility, impacts, and site dimensions. This request does not meet the comprehensive plan policy 213B for designated special hazard, special flood hazard areas as recreation and open space on the future land use map. And again, the request is for 4.58 acres of office and recreation and open space to 4.58 acres of low density residential. The accompanying zoning map change provides a little bit more detail for this pro project. Uh, Witherspoon Garrett Road, case Z1500037, applicant is the same, Culture Jewel Thames, it's in the city's jurisdiction. The existing zoning district of the site is uh, office institutional and the request is for a residential role with the development plan and along with that comes some commitments. Uh, uh, site acreage is the same, 4.58 acres and the proposed use, which is actually a committed use, uh, agriculture and support uses including retail. Again, the site's at 4800 Garrett Road between US 15501 Highway and Old Chapel Hill Road in the suburban tier. Um, the New Hope Creek and associated floodplains run west of the site uh, for context. The request does meet the criteria and standards for the residential rural district. Uh, the residential rural district does allow and permit agricultural uses um, and those have been reflected here. 
The existing site has an approximate uh, 6,000 square foot building and associated parking area uh, along the front frontage of Garrett Road. And the proposal uh, shows the building and parking envelope and access points. There's no tree coverage required in the RR district. Um, uh, and there's a number of commitments. Uh, the maximum floor area for the building area is 28,800 square feet. The maximum area for cold frames is 31,200 square feet for a total of 60,000 square feet. There's two site access points and pervious surf in surface maximum would, is committed at 100%. The, um, the graphic location of the two site access points and building a parking lot envelopes are committed. And uh, there are some text commitments. The use will, will be agriculture and accessory retail sales. Northbound left turn lane on Garrett Road at site access and the applicant commits to constructing a bus pullout and concrete pad or bus shelter and dedication of right of way along Garrett Road. This request is not consistent with the future land use map. Uh, however, you did hear that request prior to this item. This request does satisfy the policies or meet the policies that are applicable to the zoning map change. And staff determines that should the plan amendment be approved, this request would be consistent with the future land use map of the comprehensive plan and other adopted plans and ordinances. And staff is available for your questions. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Mr. I Chairman, a, I guess a point of privilege, if I may. Uh, after consultation with staff, I did want all the members of the Planning Commission to know that I have a contractual relationship with these applicants in that they take care of my roses. Um, and while I do not believe that that qualifies as grounds for uh, recusal or disqualification, it is something I wanted everybody to be aware of. Uh, I'm one of their customers. So if, if that causes anybody to be concerned about my participation, I understand that and I will recuse myself. So what's the pleasure of the group? Now let me put it this way. Is anybody in opposition to Commissioner Miller sitting and participating in the discussion? No. Okay, so stay. Uh, but I we do one, expect roses. <laughs> <laughs> I have one person signed up to speak. Are there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak to this? item. Okay, Dan Jules in speaking in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Yes, I'm I'm Dan Jewell with Coulter Jewel Thames at 111 West Main Street. Uh, we're privileged to have been asked by the Pike family uh, to help them with the proposed relocation of their business Witherspoon Rose, Cult Rose Culture from uh, the current location at Watkins Road to this, the former Yates Baptist Association. It was not a place of worship. It was actually the offices for the Yates Baptist Association, which I understand was a uh, consortium of 120 churches that do uh, philanthropic efforts in the community and have now relocated. Uh, with me here this evening are uh, the owners of Witherspoon Rose, David Pike and Rhonda, formerly Witherspoon Pike. They are the third generation uh, owner, family owners now of this business, which goes back over 60 years in Durham. Uh, they've been at their current location for nearly 60 years, uh, and they have 30 Durham-based employees who they put to work every day uh, doing what they do best, which is uh, keeping Durham beautiful and, uh, and doing good in the community, uh, uh, in, in, in including taking care of uh, Mr. Miller and, and many other people's roses in the, in the community. Also, interesting side note with me here tonight, uh, Andy Porter, uh, the landscape architect in my office who's taken the lead on putting the application together, actually used to work for Witherspoon Rose several years ago before he, uh, he, he came to work for us. So he has a, a special connection to what they do and the design. Um, as uh, I will advance this really quickly. As, as Amy said, um, 
our, we have two requests here tonight. One is for a, a plan amendment to a less intensive designation office to low density residential for the majority of this property and a down zoning from the current office designation to rural residential. Uh, I have a map up here that shows you what's going on. Of course, I think many of you are familiar with, with where Witherspoon uh, currently is. Hopefully you visited their Rose Garden. Uh, it's a great place to go take photographs, look at roses and that sort of thing. Uh, literally, they wanted to stay close to the neighborhood. They're moving about three quarters of a mile away over to Garrett Road. Uh, you can see though that the proposed site is about half the size of the current site, which means they're going to have to be much more efficient in their use of the property and their layout, which is, uh, which is one of the things that we're going to talk to you about this evening. Uh, their current location, as you know, is, you know, when they started, there was nothing out there. It was the country. When I first moved to Durham a little over 30 years ago, there was nothing out there. They were just in the middle of the country. And since then, they're now in the middle of Patterson Place. They have restaurants and hotels and office buildings and stores and apartment buildings all around them. And I think the key thing for future use is that they are literally across the street from the proposed Patterson Place light rail station. So it, uh, it, it sets up an opportunity for some future development of some, at some point. By every measure, uh, what we are proposing is a less intensive land use than what would be allowed under the current zoning and land use de designation. This goes to traffic, building height, water use demands, school impact, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. The site is already partially developed, uh, so the new development would be an incremental addition to what is already out there as opposed to starting with a totally undeveloped site. Um, the, the, the rub though, as we know, is that there is a small portion, three-tenths of an acre, uh, designated as recreation and open space on the future land use map. This plan uh, shows that overlain with a few other things. So if you, if you can see this uh, southwest corner of the site, there's, there's this finger about 40 or 50 feet wide, which, which intrudes up into the site that was designated as, as recreation and open space. Because of that, we know the staff was compelled to uh, rec say that we are not consistent with the, uh, with the future land use map, and, and we know that they had no choice uh, but to do that. Uh, please keep in mind, though, there are several compelling reasons why we think we are actually providing a better contribution to the community, uh, a, a better, uh, 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 better thing for, for, uh, for wildlife and, and, uh, and open space uh, by making some modifications to that uh, by, by uh, what we're proposing tonight. Uh, First and foremost, uh, this has an air photo overlain with a few other things that are going on there. If any of you are familiar with this property, there's a huge stump dump out behind this thing. Probably 30 years ago, it may have been used when they were building I-40. There are these all over the place. Literally, this mountain is six or seven acres at its base, and it's 54 feet high. It's probably the most imposing bit of terrain in, in southern Durham. Uh, the Fred Astaire studio is on the north, and there is, they've started construction on a multifamily development to the south, which will literally come right up to the southern property line. The second thing I'd like you to keep in mind is that the small amount of floodplain that is on the property, and that's what compelled the uh, future land use map designation for recreation and open space, is not part of the flowing waters of Sandy Creek to the far north. It's not part of the flowing waters of New Hope Creek to about a quarter mile to the rest. Wa rather, it's simply an area when those two floodplains start filling up it backs up into this area during a 100-year floodplain a small amount. We've had our flood consultant look at this, and she thinks that when this stump dump was built, it actually displaced the water in the floodplain and pushed it into this area. So think of, a, think of a puddle and dropping a big shovel full of dirt in there and what it does. It sort of pushes the water out around the edges, and she feels that, that that's probably what happened here into this, uh, what she calls, ineffective flow area. Uh, 
And uh, also keep in mind that the blue hatched area on the site that I've shown, that's a 40 foot wide city of Durham sewer easement. So <laughs> most of this area shown as open space and recreation is actually a city sewer easement. And there it is right there. The city water management department maintains it. They keep it clear. They'll go out and mow it every, every couple of years. So that is what we're, we're actually dealing with. Um, we do respect the efforts of the steering committee that worked on the future land use map back about uh, 10, 12 years ago. I actually sat in on, on many of those meetings and they had a tough task because they were looking at literally thousands of tracts of property in Durham and trying to determine land use. And using the FEMA flood maps as a guide for open space was a, a reasonable guideline at the time. Uh, they did not have time to go out at every site and see whether every little finger of floodplain actually had a good potential for open space and recreation sp space. And, and that's why we think that uh, this little three-tenths of an acre finger on this site uh, is actually not uh, a good candidate for open space and, and, and uh, recreation. What we are committed to doing though is if you again look in that southwest corner of the site, the little green notch there, so there is an area of New Hope Creek bottomlands inventory that was identified on the site. Now the, the ordinance does not say that we can't do something in there but we are choosing to preserve that. So that is an area of habitat and vegetation that is contributing to the contiguous New Hope Creek bottomlands, uh, which are adjacent and to the, uh, the south and west. You can see on this map the development to the south. They are saving those bottomlands along the back. We are connecting up with that and even providing some landscape buffer on the backside. That'll help uh, screen that, that stump dump area as well. And, uh, and so we think we are actually creating a, a, um, an equal or better situation than we have today. When you take into account that this project will require uh, uh, rigorous stormwater management that does not exist today, uh, that we are much less intensive use, as, uh, as Amy said, than, uh, than, than exists today, uh, and that we are freeing up eight acres of land right in the middle of the future, the Patterson Place Light Rail Station area, which could allow transit supportive development, which of course will require rezoning, which of course you will all see someday. We think that's a, a win-win for, uh, for Durham. And uh, that's why we hope and, and respectfully request that you would actually grant our request for changing the entire property to low density residential and that we are actually providing a commensurate amount of environmental benefit by uh, changing the small amount of, uh, of recreation and open space to residential. Uh, I thank you and the Pikes thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to speak to this item? If not, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Do I have commissioners wishing to speak? Anyone down here? Hands? No, I didn't. I didn't see your hand. Um, Hyman, Whitley, Ryan, okay. Huff? No. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Freeman. My first question was just on the, the rural, the residential rural with development plan. Um, if you could explain that a little bit, what that is, the proposed zoning. Sure. The, um, the request is for the residential rural district, which allows agriculture as a use. There are slightly different standards that apply to a non-residential use in this residential district, which includes, um, you'll notice, um, the setbacks for farm buildings is different than um, a, a residential structure. Um, uh, the other uh, requirement that would be required uh, of, a, of a 
residential development and suburban tier would be uh, tree coverage, which is not a requirement of the residential rural district. Those are reflected on the development plan, and what you see uh, in the staff report is typical of a development plan where it, it shows the required elements with the building and parking envelope and, and, and all the other items. In this case, with the exception of tree coverage, because it's not a requirement, um, uh, identified access points um, and intensity and impervious surface and those sorts of things. And then also, that mound that I'm um, sorry, Mr. Jewell explained. Mm -hmm. Is that owned by the United States, like government, or is it? Because I'm um, trying to understand if it will be addressed. I, I did. It won't. It's not part of this request. Um, that is my recollection as a private owner. It's not owned by um, that's the what federal it says, government. It says on the map was United States. Like, um, there's property behind that that is owned um, by the uh, um, a different entity, a government entity. Okay but not that particular piece. If I might, Amy is correct. Yes, that is not owned. That is not part of the Army Corps of Engineers land. It's owned by a private developer. And uh, interestingly, the only person that showed up at our neighborhood meeting was that owner. Uh, and he tried to sell that to the uh, Pikes and they respectfully declined, so. And then also, uh, Mr. Jewell, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it was back to staff. So removing the hazard um, that, would, that was placed on this property, what effect would that have? Like, um, If you'll permit me to interpret what I think you asked. I'm sorry, yes. um, The Please. special flood hazard area? Yes. That, okay, that, um, that is reflected on our future land use map in the green color, which is re recreation and open space. Yes. And so, um, your question was, what if we removed that? If you, well, if you remove it, what effect will that have? Will if, we, if we change the, RO, the recreation and open space designation to something else? Yes. Um, then it would be something else. Our policies require us to designate it as recreation and open space. And so removing it to a different category is at the, um, the purview of council um, approval, um, but we are guided by the principles of the comprehensive plan that direct us to keep it as recreation and open space. Now there's different uh, applications uh, when you get into the zoning, which is why the zoning does meet all the criteria of the comprehensive plan because there's no specific guidance on what development intensities can be applied in the recreation and open space areas. Our only guidance between the two application requests is that we keep it identified as recreation and open space on the future land use map. Okay. Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, Amy, I'm, I need to follow up with you on uh, <coughs> what, <coughs> man on uh, this conversation. So this, this land being, uh, their, their request is to change it to residential mm -hmm. and this is a business, I guess, then this is an allowable use? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that answers that question. And I, I have a question uh, for Dan or anybody. I think this area across the street isn't there. Uh, it's not a nursing home. Uh, what do you call it when you assisted living? Assisted place? living. I think it's Carillon is what it's called. Yeah, Carillon. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, this area is developing quite nicely, I think, into a pretty nice neighborhood, and I I think this is a good use for uh, this tract of land. Uh, Everybody knows about Witherspoon roses, and <laughs> I, I would certainly like to keep them in the area, so I, I would support this. I, I don't see any reason why not. Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, it, well, let me ask this staff, Dan. Um, 
this is kind of a goofy sort of thing. We don't see business in residential. We don't bring rural into the suburban tier very often. So it's a lot of things that are kind of crossways to what we're accustomed to. That doesn't mean necessarily that we shouldn't do it. What other zoning districts could this particular use go in? D does it have to be in rural residential to exist at all? She just gave me the finger. <laughs> oh, wrong finger. Never mind. She did give you a finger. Well, it was her last chance. <laughs> clarify that was my index finger <laughs> um, so uh, there are two districts that permit an agricultural use um, it's the residential rural district and the residential the, uh, the residential suburban 20 district um, the request when it came in um, the director reviewed what the existing use was at the the operations current location mm -hmm. And they requ requested a use determination from the director. And they, the, the determination what is, was at agricultural use. Um, agricultural uses do permit um, a certain level of retail sales along with them. So based on the information provided to us, um, there's two districts that this use could be um, so permitted. So it could go in, in RS20? Uh, RS20 and RR. And RR. Based on the information and the determination made, and is it Dan? Um, is one preferable than the other, from from the applicant's point of view? We we always try and strive for the least intensive district when we come in front of you and the council. So that's why we chose the uh, I, rural residential. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so my next question is re with regard to the the conundrum regarding the other finger we talked about, which is this uh, on the future land use map uh, uh, that protrudes into the property. Uh, since a lot, as you pointed out, a lot of that's already in a city sewer easement where you're not gonna build anyway, could you increase or change your commitment, your development plan to, to make more of that uh, finger area um, open space and so consequently less jarring to less jarring a change so um, we uh, as I said the we have we have designed a site plan for this site we are actually on the verge of submitting a site plan which is a risk because uh, the, the sure. pikes have a they have everything revolves around their growing season and then when they get this get stuff in and that sort of thing so they're 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 hopeful that this will move ahead exp expeditiously and that's why they have us working on the site plan. So they, they will need to put some uh, truck movement and you know, lay down area, hoop houses, that sort of thing. So some of it may be paved, some of it not, may not be paved, but again, that's all gonna be handled as site plan as part of our stormwater management plan. So there'll be slow water down and that sort of thing. So, uh, that, that's a long convoluted answer, answer to your question saying that we, we, uh, we, we will probably do something in that area other than just keep it open. But again, that's why we, uh, we, we went ahead and committed to the bottomlands area, which is about two tenths of an acre, which is a three tenths, and why we also showed that we've got a, a landscape buffer along the back side. So we have at least that much, as much green space as we have today and it won't be uh, mown by the city. So when we went out and looked at property last week, uh, Commissioner Huff and I, we went over and visited the current site, uh, and it looks like it's, there are, on that site there are two residential structures, uh, which are not part of the business, I don't believe. Uh, there is a retail structure, uh, there were some garages and some sheds and things like that, and then there were lots of, of there were some permanent buildings and some impermanent buildings mm -hmm. which were used for uh, handling and uh, pr preparation of roses for sale. Mm -hmm. And then a large part of the property was a garden. Yes. What are you gonna put on this property? So we Since will, it's only half the size. Yes, so, uh, so, so to clarify, the residential looking buildings on the current property were, were houses at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some, some of the family lived in those houses, but now they are 
uh, offices and, and things of that so nature. So every building out there is used for the operation. So uh, the plan right now, the site plan we've shown, is the existing Yates Baptist Association office building will be both offices and uh, the small retail center. You'll walk from there out into the garden because one of their big things is to have the rose display area. There will be one additional building though that will account for where they have to keep the equipment inside that needs to stay out of the weather. So um, if, uh, if somebody were to have asked us to master plan the original Witherspoon uh, property where they are now with all of the complex of buildings, and I came up with that solution, I should have taken my license, uh, had my license taken away from me. But it, they have grown over the years. That's what they did. They, they built as was needed. So this, this will be much more organized, as I said, as it needs to be, so, since they're going to be on half of the acreage that they are today. And so you, does your site plan involve the portion of the property which is on the other side of the easement, uh, the sewer easement? Yes. Yes, okay, it so does. You're, you're, you're pretty much taking up every, so when you, what you show is your building envelope is pretty much all going to be involved. Uh, pretty much it. What it doesn't show, though, on all sides, and we just decided to illustrate it on this side, is, is our, we are going to be required to have uh, landscape buffers, which uh, we, would not be required if we built uh, just a single family house out there, as, as Amy was saying. So there'll be landscape buffers around the property. But the rest of it will be pretty, pretty well developed out, other than we're using the existing driveway and the existing parking area. And on the, uh, the very helpful uh, illustration you gave us here, where will the garden be? The garden will be roughly to the um, west of where the existing uh, Yates uh, office building is. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to put the other building in to create a space uh, which would define that garden area. And the idea would be that you could uh, walk through the garden and walk out the retail space and buy some roses or some potting soil or whatever or walk into it. So roughly in the middle of the site, just to the west of where the existing building is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Hyman. Uh, Mr. Jewell, you probably, I think I'm probably the third person to, to ask or re-ask the same question concerning the recre recreation and open space area mm -hmm. because I always like to look at the, you know, what are the consequences of, of um, you know, basically changing that designation. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is that um, it's, it's basically um, sewage area currently or, or, or it wasn't really designated so that it could be used as so It's predominantly so. a sewage, city sewer easement that is mown by the city. So if, you're, if your idea of recreation is to hang out in a sewer easement, then you've got your thing going there. But, but other, other than that, that's, that's what it's being used for. So yes. that's, that's essentially what I'm asking for yes. clarification because it sounds like we're going to have something in that area that's um, much more uh, pleasant than, than what's currently there in that we can look forward to having Witherspoon roses for some time to come. I have some in my yard as well. Perhaps not, they haven't been cared for as much, but I love and would love to see it grow. So I'd like to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Rather than tree coverage, we're going to have rose coverage. Just right. keep that in. <laughs> Commissioner Whitley? You forgot you were going to say something. <laughs> yeah, I'm sh I'm pretty sure I understand, although you're asking for low residential, you're not planning on building housing in this area. You're just going to build. No, no, sir. Uh, and if you look at our, uh, our, our cover sheet of our development plan and the first phase and our committed elements, I mean, we are actually committing to a specific use, which is a agricultural business with accessory retail sales and uh, and as you can see we've also committed to maximum square footages and building heights we normally don't do that but we know we know exactly what we need to build so that's why we've committed to that and I think that's that's pretty well tied down on our development plan okay question for staff Yes, you. The one with the finger. <laughs> Sorry, we have several staff over here. How can I help you? 
Listen, um, now we're, we're being asked to allow building in a recreational area. Would we be setting, we would be setting a president? Typically when we have zoning map changes here, I would say the majority of those applications show the building and parking envelope outside of those areas, but not all development that comes before you are required to show a building and parking envelope. Uh, single family development is not required to show a building and parking envelope. Um, by committing and being required to commit to a building parking envelope on the development plan, at this stage uh, would allow the applicant to create a site plan based on that. So the building and parking envelope for non-residential uses, which this is, as an agricultural use in a residential district, typically a single family residential district, however the building parking envelope is required, um, typically we do see building and parking envelopes outside of the recreation and open space areas in this case, it's um, the recreation and open space area is consistent with this mapped special flood area, which would require an additional level of approval at site plan should the design include development in those areas at site plan. So you are being asked by the applicant to approve development in these areas. It's not, it is permitted by, by the ordinance, um, however, just just to be aware that that's not the end of it. There's additional levels of approval that are required once the designs are submitted through the site plan stage. So I'm to understand that um, it would be making a president, I mean, we'll, we'll be doing something different. And if another applicant came with a different project, I'm thinking if someone came with a different project, it wouldn't be coming with an agricultural structure, it'd be coming with something completely different. So I, I'm not sure what you're asking me. Um, I'm just trying we, to get my head around um, sure. why, I mean, if, if I vote yes for this, um, will, I, will I have the opportunity to vote yes? I mean, yes or no, if something else comes and they ask for the same thing. But, but this is unique in that it's, it's for agricultural structure, not not something that's going to have an address and a door. It's not the house. It's not housing. Correct. It's a committed agricultural use. Right. Thank you. Mr. Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the one thing that really bothers me about this recreation and open space area. When I went out and looked at the site, parked in the parking lot, walked up to the building, and then walked out toward the recreation and open space area, I saw a ravine, which I estimated might be from where I was standing about 30 feet deep. And uh, I'm having a whole lot of problems seeing how you're going to be able to use it. It's a hole in the ground. Are you sure you stayed on this property? I was on that property. And not, not only, and not only that, but I happened to be out there after it rained and down in the bottom there was a little flow of water. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a little ditch, a little rivulet of water. Yeah. It's not a jurisdictional stream. There's yeah, no wetlands. We, we've had that done. So. Um, 
it, it's not 30 feet deep. There is a low area. I'd be happy to go out there with you with our uh, our survey equipment and, and verify. That. We can we can do that. But it looked to me like this is a problem spot. I can't say how you're going to use it, whether it's 30 feet, 20 feet, even 10 feet. And and that I I, I respectfully say that's one of the reasons that we've set aside this corner as part of the uh, the bottomlands inventory, which so. is the deepest part yes. from best I could tell. But I I, I would prefer that you s save the recreation open space area, all of it. Understood. Commissioner Goose. Thank you, Chair Harris. Um, question for staff, uh, I guess. Um, I wonder if you can give me any insight on how the uh, recreation open space is determined. Like the, I, I realize this was determined some time ago, um, but you know what kind of criteria were they looking at, generally speaking? In this particular case, there, um, well, the policy referenced uh, spells out which property would be mapped as recreation and open space. In this particular case. This property has special flood hazard area mapped on it. And so that line when the uh, map was created in 2005 um, followed that line, simply put. And at that time, was there no consideration given to, in this case, the underlying utility? I can't speak to that. I, by my observation, there's uh, easements typically are in uh, areas that are low and near a, uh, a, a riparian feature um, by my observation. Um, so I think that's a common thing to see in a, in a low area. Okay, um, I, I mean, and this is in response to a comment we heard, not necessarily a question, um, but I would take issue uh, with the idea that the building or whatever is not generally allowed or done in recreational open space. In fact, you can look at this case right here. There's a there's a utility line that's construction in the uh, open and recreation space. So I mean, I I I personally don't have any qualms with um, allowing specifically this re recreation and open space to to uh, no longer be considered as such, given that it's really not going to be maintained in any kind of natural um, state. Uh, it, you know, if that line were to break, for example, I guarantee you they dig that up. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think it's really a great candidate for recreational open space to begin with. Uh, so changing it doesn't really bother me too much. Um, I also would uh, like to ask, and, and Maybe I'm out of line here, but I am interested in uh, w you know the possibilities out there at Patterson Place, where the business is currently located. I think that that's a huge uh, uh, aspect of this project that we should not lose sight of. That is a you know in my mind on the map it looks like it might be like a three minute walk to the light rail. Um, so uh, moving moving the business to Garrett Road, I'm. I'm Wondering uh, if maybe you could speak to what, what might be going on out there in the future, because it uh, certainly seems like a great opportunity. Um, I, I don't believe I can speak to it other than the, uh, the comprehensive planning uh, effort that's in place right now in the location of the, uh, uh, the light rail station literally across the street. Uh, would would speak to me that anybody getting control of that property would be interested in doing some sort of a dense mixed-use project that would be transit supportive and hopefully by the time that comes forward uh, there will be an adopted comprehensive plan uh, the uh, the expectation will be there of the type of zoning that would be in there uh, and all of the conversations that go on with affordable housing and everything else and hopefully we will have a policy in place by then uh, so that every developer coming forward knows what the requirements not are not what the requirement or expectations might be so that's all I can speak to but I I can't see why anybody would not build something transit supportive from both a density and use standpoint on that almost nine acres of land over there let's let's pray that you're right on that um, also just a, maybe a question for the pikes 
I, I imagine you all are accustomed to growing things like roses, for example. Uh, I mean, is the site wet? Is it fertile? I mean, I imagine you guys have, have looked at this site for the viability of your business, and I'm wondering um, if you could speak maybe a little bit to why you chose this site specifically. It seems, I mean, it sounds like a great site to me. I'm just wondering. Sir, would you come to the mic so they can hear you at home? I'm, I'm sorry to make you walk all the way up here to the podium. I'm David Pike, the president of Witherspoon Rose Culture. Um, we've had the luxury for 60 years to spread out and uh, take advantage of that land and develop it as a rose garden. Speaking from an employee side, it's not user friendly for our staff. Um, pulling carts of roses from the bottom of that property to the guard shop day after day wears on you. Um, and it's not efficient use of that land for us. We've made it work for us. Um, and this new site will be more efficient, will be tighter, and can control ourselves better instead of just spreading out and not using things efficiently. Um, I don't know if that's... No, I think that makes perfect sense. And I guess you guys have uh, evaluated this Yes, this um, site and, uh, in our bed prep, when we go into a site, um, we use the native soils there and we'll select a site um, there. And then from once we get into preparing the beds, we build up the areas with lots of organic material you know, to make the native soil there enriched so it's better suited for growing roses. So none of the current existing environmental features at this property concern you? You think that this would be a viable site for your business? Um, it will be challenging, but I think we, it, from what our staff has looked at and mapped out, um, we can do everything on that site that we're currently doing. Great. At our other site, uh, with your approval. I, it may be obvious, but I'll just go ahead and say I plan on voting in favor of this. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Huff. Um, this is a question for staff. What can, kind of uh, things can go across that sewer easement? What kind of, you know, what do you, can you put over it? Driveways, pathways, uh, what kind of stuff? I think it depends. Uh, I think it depends on the language of the easement. I'm not familiar with easement language. I, I, think, I think it's certainly, um, it would have to be looked into before uh, before approving any any type of development over easements, so I, I can only confirm that it's worth um, pursue, uh, looking into. Well, uh, pr presumably they're going to be able to traverse the easement, right? With some kind of. Uh... I will. I'm not staff, but we've 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 done this a hundred times. Um, we cannot put buildings in the sewer easements, yeah, uh, but but we can. Uh, put pavement in there, pathways, uh, gardens, things of that nature. The caveat, though, is that the, uh, the Durham Public Works Department says if you put something in there um, and we have to dig the sewer line up to fix it, <laughs> we're not going to put, put it back the way it was. It would be up to the, the owners to do that. Uh -huh. But you couldn't put a hoop house in there? The, the hoop house, um, probably not. Probably not because it has a... Um, it has a wooden foundation, uh -huh. and I think the, the Public Works Department would consider that a building. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Miller. So Dan, um, back again to this uh, uh, finger of recreation and open space land. Uh, if we were to expand the committed open space area to include uh, more or all of it, would the site be usable for these applicants? If w in the in the current configuration, um, it is not usable. It, it, it is that tight. 
Uh, as Mr. Bryan said, the, uh, the challenging, most challenging portion of the site is that southwest corner. That's also the area that is part of the inventory, which was why we felt comfortable in setting that aside. Uh, and of course, there is a landscape buffer on the south side too. But it's a, uh, if this finger of land had followed the southern property line or the western property line, it would not have been a problem. But the fact that it angles up and intrudes, um, that is what would create more than a challenge, as uh, Mr. Pike said. It would, it would really make the site unusable for them. And is, I know you told us this, is the landscape buffer that you've run against the stump dump required? Yes, it is. I mean, the obvious trouble here for some of the Planning Commission members is to, to not make a recommendation to the City Council that is contrary to a policy in the comprehensive plan. Uh, there are a lot of unusual things about this zoning proposal. We have a, we're moving rural into the suburban. We're using a residential designation for an exceptionally low intensity business. Uh, so there's a lot of things that make, make this different in the two, and it's how to weigh them out. I know that a lot of people here would feel better if we could say this is okay because uh, m most of that uh, area that is designated uh, as open space or recreation use is, has been preserved by this development plan. I would feel a lot better about it. Uh, and I was just wondering is there a way to add more uh, to what you've already reserved uh, or to even if you plan to use it to designate in committed elements a, the lowest possible intensity of use for the area that's described by that green line on your very helpful illustration. In other words, I don't know exactly what your site plan proposes for that area, uh, but I suppose instead of just saying it's just going to be open space, the only thing we're going to put in here is a rose garden uh, or something like that. Uh, it would make me feel better about making the recommendation uh, that we're going to make uh, uh, to the city council going forward. I understand. I'm looking for a way to make this work and resolve this point of tension. I, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Miller. And uh, it, 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 again, we have done a site plan for this. We've looked closely at it. And, and to make this work for them, we do need to use the building envelope area of this property for uh, the additional building we need to make, make the truck moving area, the hoop houses, things of that nature. I suppose we could go to the Public Works Department and see if maybe hoop houses, which are partially a, a green thing rather than a, uh, uh, a, 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 you know, a gravel paved thing for uh, uh, carts or whatever. Uh, Keep in mind, though, that we are going to have a substantially large rose garden, um, <laughs> which obviously they're 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 happy to commit to. Um, but the the way the site is laying out nicely is for this additional building that would be built, which would be roughly just to the east of the sewer easement area, sets up a very nice space for a garden to go in. You know, gardens are made even more special if they have walls around them and that would be be the case uh, case here so I think right now it'd be tough to commit to not do to do only soft stuff in that um, in that last uh, 0.15 acres of finger or whatever that goes up into the site it's not that big is it uh, the whole the whole finger is like three tenths of an acre right so it wouldn't be point so it's it would be 0.15. Uh, well, the, the, the portion... It's, it's half the finger. Yeah, it's half the... Up to the knuckle. It's half the finger. And, and Andy just did a ca quick calculation, and, and we're a little over... We're about two-tenths of an acre on this committed bottomlands area. So it's not quite one for one, but we're, we're two-thirds of the way there. But, but certainly, <laughs> we're going to have some, some nice garden areas out there that'll, you know... And is that, is that a, a reasonable offset to this uh, Moan sewer easement area? Uh, from what we have today, and I, I take Reverend, Reverend Whitley's comments to heart. Also, uh, you know, precedent is always always important, but you also, I know, are are always very thoughtful in looking at every that request that comes to you on a case by case basis and seeing if there are extenuating circumstances that that would would give you uh, a reason to do something different. So uh, that's why uh, in zoning cases, precedent is maybe not quite as uh, 
is, is, uh, is critical because uh, everybody has to come forward to you and plead your case. How many, remind me, Dan, how many total, what's your committed maximum for building square footage? 28,000 square feet. So a little over half acre on a four and a half acre site, 4.6 acre site. But you probably don't propose to use all 28,000 of that, do you? 28,000 is about what we're gonna end up with. But that uh, includes the hoop houses? Uh, does not include the hoop houses. All right. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Amy. Uh, I, I did want to clarify the development plan commits to 28,800 building square feet. So just for a point of clarification. Thank you. Commissioner Freeman. Just, Amy, if you could come back, I'm sorry. Just a question, how are um, sewer easements usually classified? How about that? Um, they're, they're not a, a classified use um, in terms of, of a future land use or, or in our use table. Um, it's, it's, it's a feature of, a, of site design, of okay. building or communities. <laughs> So in this, in this case, I don't, the easement is not so much the issue in that, I mean, I wanna know why it was classified because this, this pipe, this line that runs underneath the property runs across that Garrett Road. Sure, the, um, it was classified as recreation open space simply based on the mapped, the, the FEMA maps, the special flood hazard areas. And it so happens to have a sewer easement in it okay. that happened over time. Commissioner Bryant. Another question for staff. Uh, you mentioned that it was created by looking at the FEMA flood hazard areas, but these do have a tendency to change. Has this been updated any time recently? This is my understanding that so the original 0.3 acres, I believe, or the, the green area shown on the future land use map was provided or mapped in 2005. And we have gotten updated FEMA maps since then. And it is my understanding that those increased over time. There has not been an update to the future land use map. So the area you're seeing on our mapped future land use map is actually smaller than what we believe the special hazard, flood hazard area is today. Okay, thank you. Um, just to the applicant, um, I very much appreciate the situation that the Rose Garden, Witherspoon Rose Garden is in. Um, I'm going to be voting no, not because I don't appreciate you. I think you're trying to do a very good thing. I don't feel comfortable going against the staff when it comes to recreation open space area. I personally feel that that's a decision that really needs to be made by the governing body. Commissioner Bucks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was actually going to make very similar comments. I, I appreciate the proposal. There's a lot of great opportunities here and, and appreciate the great business, but I'm concerned as well, especially with uh, flooding concerns. It sounds like this may still get additional clarity as it moves forward. I hope it does. In that situation, I might be able to support it, but without that clarity tonight, I'm going to vote against it. Commissioner Whitley. Um. I, I plan to vote for this. I, I just, um, I feel uncomfortable, um, but I plan to vote for it. I think it's unique. And Durham is about, a lot of the good things we love about this city are those unique things that we put in place. So, Give them a shot. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gibbs. Uh, I'd like, I kind of go along with the comments uh, just preceding me, uh, but the Yates Baptist Association has been operating on this piece of property for years. Uh, What's planned to go there is 
I think it's going to be an improvement on on that. Uh, and I plan to support this. I I think it's a good use of this land. A floodplain is going to wash away, uh, <laughs> or the hundred-year flood, or whatever that may come, may require an ark or whatever. But it would affect the Yates Baptist Association building just like it would with a spoon rose culture or Sam's quick pick, whatever goes there. So I, and I don't, uh, I don't think it's that far off from uh, the future land use uh, for this area. So I, I do plan to support it and um, I think we should send it forward to the city council for with a recommendation to approve. Is that a motion? Okay. Second. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> so I have a motion from uh, Commissioner Gibbs that we move forward with. This is the plan amendment. The plan amendment A1500023. I have a second. Second by Commissioner Bryant. Roll call, please. Ms. Winders? Yes. Mr. Whitley? Yes. Mr. Kinchin? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Van? Yes. Ms. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Huff? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Ghosh? Yes. Mr. Busby? No. Mr. Bryan? No. The motion carries 11 to 2. Okay. And the zoning case? Mr. Chairman, if I may, I move the that we send case Z1500037 forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second by uh, Commissioner Whitley, that we move zoning case 1500037 to City Council with a favorable recommendation. Roll call, please. Ms. Huff? Ms. Huff? Ms. Hyman? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Ms. Freeman? Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Ghosh? Yes. Mr. Busby? No. Mr. Bryan? No. Mr. Kinchin? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Ms. Winders? Yes. Mr. Whitley? Yes. Mr. Van? Yes. Motion carries 11 to 2. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a very <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and now we will have the public hearing open for the uh, UDO, Text Amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance, TC 1500002. Thank you very much. Good evening. Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Text Amendment TC 150002 uh, provides new graphics or revisions to existing graphics for current standards within the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, they are tech, these are technical uh, amendments. Uh, they consist primarily of new graphics for infill standards in section uh, 6.8, revised graphics for yard definitions in section 16.3, uh, graphics for fences and walls in section 6, uh, section 9.9, .9, uh, new graphics for bicycle parking standards in paragraph 10.4.4, and uh, associated uh, minor technical corrections or clarifications that are related to the graphics. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I do want to make one note. I received uh, an email from Commissioner Huff regarding a proposed um, uh, technical correction to uh, Section 1044B1B, which goes into the uh, placement of racks being placed end to end, and she proposed some clarification language to allow for a shorter distance uh, when it's along a wall. And yeah, so instead of 96 inches it would be 60 inches from se for separation of different racks in a linear fashion and we can make that adjustment as as before it moves forward to the elected bodies be happy to answer any questions 
do we have anyone wishing to speak? <laughs> Still okay, got one. Okay, if not, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Uh, I see, I see three on the end. Uh, bam, bam, bam. Miller and Okay, uh, Commissioner Huff. Um, there were a couple of concerns that Bike Pit had. One of them um, has to do with the size of these uh, uh, images, especially the ones, um, sh the diagrams illus illustrating minimum side by side placement where you've got all of the numbers. Those we, are very tiny. We, anything that is ultimately produced in the ordinance, we will make sure that is clear and readable. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was, uh, that was it. Okay, thank you. And thank you for these nice illustrations. Sure. Commissioner yeah. Gush. Um, I had a question um, on, well, page three of my handout. Um, the blue line, and I, I, yeah, the blue line in the middle of the two parcels there? It's a strike through line. Okay, that's what I was, yes. I was, yes. I didn't understand. That's all I really needed to know. No problem. Commissioner Bryant. Um, looking on page three again, uh, um, I guess it's the double frontage lot diagram. Um, you've got streets on both sides uh, and you've got street yard noted on both sides. But then you get over to uh, page nine when you're looking at fences, and here you've got another situation where you have actually got the house on the left. You've got street on both sides, but suddenly the street yard, the second street yard, has become a rear yard. That is not listed as a rear yard. It is just indicating rear of the of the primary structure because there's different requirements for uh, allowances for fence height when a fence is to the rear of the property. And we can clarify that. If okay, we because that. The word yard is intention. Correct. Yeah, I, I was just confused we by can, that. We can take a look at that and see if we can clarify that first. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Miller, that's you talking already. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. okay. Commissioner Freeman. I'd like to make a motion that uh, text commitment TC uh, 150002 be approved. Second. It's been motioned by Commissioner Miller, second by Commissioner Bryant, that we move. Hmm? Freeman. Okay. That we move forward with a favorable recommendation of. Uh, the UDO amendment TC15 quadruple zero two, the UDO graphics. I have a question. Is that with or without the change suggested by Commissioner Member Hub on the bike graphics? Okay. We, we, we'll take a look at the change. We'll make the changes as necessary. Yes. So it's with the change. Yes. He said he's taking a look at it. He didn't promise to change anything. We, we will make, we will make, uh, we will address the issue and we'll okay. make changes accordingly. Okay. And that's with the, with the change. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Bryan. Uh, yes. yes. Mr. Busby. Yes. Mr. Ghosh. Yes. Mr. Gibbs. Yes. Ms. Hyman. Yes. Ms. Huff. Ms. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Keenchin? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Van? Yes. Mr. Whitley? Yes. Ms. Winders? Yes. The motion carries 13 to 0. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, open, uh, open hearing on TC15 quadruple zero six reasonable accommodations good we evening commissioner been. members commission members this is Supriya with planning department um, I'm here to present to you the reasonable accommodation regulations and procedure that staff has developed um, Fed's Federal Housing Administration and the American um, Americans with Disability Act prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in housing 
So to better comply with the FHA and ADA requirements, staff is proposing revisions to the to establish a formal procedure for persons with disability, disabilities to, to seek reasonable accommodations in application to the UDO, of the UDO, and to establish criteria to be used when, when considering such request. Many, many jurisdictions in North Carolina have relied upon existing variants and or, um, or special use permit procedures to handle requests for reasonable ac accommodation, however, Legal standards for granting a reasonable accommodation differs from that of a variance or a special use permit application. These were the reasons staff decided along with the guidance from the attorney's of, attorney office to develop these regulations. Staff has established a procedure that provides the purpose and the instances in which the process is applicable. It will list the information the applicant would, use, would have to provide with the submission such as current use of the property, a proof of their disability. The process will require a quasi-judicial hearing and approval from the Board of Adjustments. The Board of Adjustments will have to make a decision based on the follow on follow following findings, that the accommodation will be used by an individual with disability, and that it is reasonable and won't impose financial burdens upon the city, that it is necessary for the individual with disability to enjoy the use and subject use of the subject property. The amendment also changes the definition of family to include where a reasonable accommodation has been approved. This, uh, this amendment will make subsequent changes to the UDO to accommodate the reasonable accommodation process such as powers and duties of the Board of Adjustment, common review procedures and notices and public hearings. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission approve this text amendment. If you have any questions, I'll take them now. Thank you. Thank you. No members in the audience wishing to speak, so we'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Do I have commissioners wishing to speak? <clears throat> okay, Commissioner Freeman and Commissioner Miller uh, and the three down there. Okay, uh, Commissioner Freeman. I just wanted to ask if it's always been included or I should say excluded for um, individuals with handicaps or disabilities, juvenile offenders? I'm sorry, say that again? It's a, it list of, of, the list includes a definition of individuals with handicaps or disabilities, and they're not included? Juvenile offenders? That's included? Like they're not. No, it won't be. Speak in the mic, please. So no, it, it will not be included. Juvenile of offenders are not persons with disabilities. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a little concerned about outside limits on this. And so here's a scenario. If I'm a person uh, with a handicap that severely limits my mobility, uh, but I am able to uh, buy and sell and I can have things delivered to my house, would I be able to apply to the Board of Adjustment for an accommodation uh, in my uh, RS-10 uh, zone home uh, to have a retail shop there because I am of limited mobility and cannot go to a, uh, an appropriately zoned uh, retail building. Would I be able to ask the Board of Adjustment for that accommodation under this? I am pretty sure not. Where does it say but that? <laughs> Help me understand. This only allows accommodations for living that was not a living accommodation, conducting a business or anything like that. Okay, that, that wasn't clear to me, uh, where, where living and working and things stop, especially since the, the definition of, of handicap frequently talks about uh, life functions, including work. Uh, so that was one concern um, about this that I had. This is, uh, I would like a clearer statement of the outside limits uh, of what is an acceptable accommodation. And uh, having actually worked in this area a little bit before I retired, uh, it, it concerns me. I, I don't want to see the Board of Adjustment placed in situations where they're going to, or the staff to turn away these requests because these requests are going to be difficult to turn away. So a clear upfront statement of what you can ask for, in my opinion, is would be helpful to everybody. Thank you. 
Commissioner Whitley. The only comment I want to make here is to staff and and to those that um, did the writings. I thought this was very well done. Thank you. And I too have done a lot of legislative work on accommodation and this was very very well done i think it uh, i'm very proud of you thank, thank you. you thank you and i would ask my, uh, my commissioners to support this measure yeah you got an edible <laughs> <laughs> commissioner bryant <laughs> thank you um the statement about people who are not in not included in the definition of individuals with a handicap persons convicted of the illegal manufacture or distribution of a controlled substance um why is that there why is it there mm -hmm. current users so the current users are excluded from this if you're recovering then you are under i mean it, you would i'm sorry did that's I, not that's not the uh, persons convicted of the illegal manufacture or distribution of controlled substances oh it's on page two so you're asking why they're not included under yeah why 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 is, why are they on this list oh this says that the following persons are not included in the definition of individuals with a handicap or disability Okay. Well, why are they not included? <laughs> That's lifted directly from the uh, federal law, Commissioner Bryan. Okay. And it certainly doesn't seem to hurt to. No, I mean the federal us. law might change, so I'm assuming that uh, there's been a lot of people convicted who've gone to prison, who've served their their sentence, they've come out. They've cleaned up their lives except for things that may have happened in prison, such as getting HIV. Uh, then, you know, and when we say they can't do this and can't get that and they have this record, it can make their lives outside pretty bad. I can certainly see that point. Um, we would prefer not to stray from the federal law that we're trying to comply with. I, I, and, I understand. And it is pe for manufacture and distribution, so not, it doesn't say people who've been convicted of well, taking drugs. Well, there have been a lot of people convicted on distribution under, well, the, uh, under the sentencing laws that, you know, third strike, you're in prison for 30 years. For having a single marijuana cigarette. That's true. I just find it harsh. Commissioner Gush. Um, I've got maybe a comment and just a couple things I noticed in the ordinance as proposed. Um, I'm wondering why, and I, I appreciate that you guys have looked at other jurisdictions and how they do it. I'm wondering why this has to go through um, kind of like a public hearing process. Uh, my concern is that if someone has a disability for which they are trying to receive an accommodation, they may not really want to make that publicly known. Um, and I, I mean, I appreciate that other jurisdictions do it this way as well. I'm wondering if we have to. Um, and if we don't have to, maybe we can look at another way to do that. Commissioner Goose, because this is a discretionary action, it has to be done through a quasi-judicial hearing. The state law doesn't give us any wiggle room on that. And this is not, this is for, if you're asking for something that is not currently permitted by the, the ordinance, for example, right. having seven unrelated people with a qualified handicap living in one single family home, which is a pretty significant change in what is normally permitted. Sure. Sure. I mean, I appreciate that. I'm just, I thought I would make the comment. And um, I mean, I do agree with the direction here that we're moving away from uh, 
hearing this or considering this as a variance and making its own category, which seems to be, the bar seems to be lower than a variance. I think that's the appropriate method here. I just have concerns that maybe someone who would otherwise seek an accommodation might be deterred from doing so just based off the fact that they do have to go through this public process. But, I mean, I appreciate the direction we're moving. Um, that being said, um, on page two, uh, 3.24.2, uh, letter B, and I hope I'm on the right topic here. <laughs> That'd be nice. Um, I, I, I think the wording of that is a little bit awkward. Um, a request for a reasonable accommodation may be made by any person with a disability or handicap, uh, his or her legal representative or provider of housing for persons with disabilities or handicaps in the city land, I mean, or handicaps in the city land use and zoning regulations, policy or practices. Um, when the application of such may, I mean, like, I just don't understand. It seems like there's something missing in there. It's just saying that yeah, I mean, it, 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 something is getting lost there. I, under, I mean, you're, you're listing the people who can um, apply for an accommodation, yeah, but I think the list the gets... Yeah, yeah, and then I think you get the grounds in there as well, and I think that gets a little bit confused. Separate. Yeah, might want to separate it. That's all I'm saying. Um, on page 3, 3.24.6, uh, 3 notice in public hearings, um, it says, and give notice as fourth in paragraph, I'm pretty sure that's supposed to say as set forth, just a typo. Oh, yeah. um, and I think those are all my comments. Thank you, we'll, we'll make those changes. Thank you. Commissioner Gibbs. I, I would just like to make a comment on this whole thing. That's, this is based on, the, on how the ADA defines disabilities. That's where the Fair Housing Act has, and any other uh, act to help people with disabilities is based on, uh, and it's described, an individual with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. An individual with a record of having such an impairment or an individual regarding as having such an impairment. And that covers the gamut from blindness to uh, not having use of, use of your legs, quadriplegic, hearing, and all of that. It does not cover, uh, the question was raised, current users of illegally controlled substances and I have read of cases where um, a smart lawyer says they're, they're addicted to these so they commit these crimes to support their, I'll say their habit. And I'm just taking that as an example. It's not the same thing as having an ADA-defined disability. And, and that's what the basis of all this is. But unfortunately, it gets to be really complicated when you try to cover all of the situations. Uh, but that's basically what this is, uh, helping people with disabilities uh, get a place to live and that uh, that um, land, let me finish. Landowners uh, uh, what cannot discriminate against renting or selling a house or whatever to someone with a disability because it may put some requirements on them that they don't want to handle. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to try to simplify that, and I hope I haven't complicated it. But uh, if so, if anybody would like to straighten me out on that, I'm willing to listen. All right, thank you. Commissioner Huff, haven't spoken. 
Um, I think the point is that uh, Commissioner Bryan was making is that a uh, person in a wheelchair uh, who sold pot is not going to be able to take advantage of these, um, these accommodations. I think that's it. And that is not fair. Okay. Well, that, that stands to reason he has a handicap. Hold on, sir. Uh, Hold on, sorry. sir. You need to get in the queue. I'm sorry. Commissioner Bryant was in the queue. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Staff. Sarah Young with the Planning Department. I just want to clarify because I think there's some confusion about the whole people, persons convicted. What the memo says, and that language is not in the ordinance. It's in the page two of the memo. And what it says is that under the definition through the ADA of what a person with a handicap is, not included in that definition are folks that have been convicted of uh, illegal manufacturing distribution. So someone cannot claim that, oh, I have a disability because I was, so I think it's actually the reverse of what you're saying. If those people had a legitimate handicap under ADA, they certainly can apply for a reasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. It's just saying that that conviction in and of itself is not a handicap. Right. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, okay. I think there's some confusion. Thank you. There. Commissioner Bryant. Um, I want to go back to page 2, paragraph B under section 324.2, uh, third line which reads, in the city's land use and zoning regulations. I think this is going to both the city and the county, so should the word county be in there somewhere? Yes. Yes, we'll make that change. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Whitley. Well, um, given that we, we have some changes, I still think this is very well written. And Charlie, um, one of the reasons why this is being brought forth is so that we can better take care of those that are handicapped. So that's the reason we have this measure to, to vote on this evening. You know, um, this opens some doors so that um, more accommodation laws can be applied to, to different structures. Okay, any other comments? Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The one thing I did forget, um, I would like for the thing to be clear that an order allowing accommodations is personal to the applicant and doesn't continue with the property after the applicant has left. Uh, Sometimes we have those questions with cases that go to the Board of Adjustment is whether or not the, the thing that the Board of Adjustment has allowed runs with the land or whether or not it's personal to the person to whom it was given. Uh, here I think it's clearly personal, but I, I would like to just go ahead and say that the accommodation, whatever it may be that's allowed, is, is, uh, lasts only so long as the person who has requested it is residing at the particular property uh, where the accommodation was requested, since this is an accommodation for a specific property. That's correct. It does not run with the property. It is a personal Yeah, but it doesn't say that. You're willing to, oh, you to want make it. that okay. inclusive. We'll definitely look into making that change. Well, if that's okay. the case, if that's going to be added, then it shouldn't it also add um, um, that they also have the option to grandfather it? The owner of the property should, should also preserve the, the right to grandfather it once it's there to keep it? If the owner is a person with disability, then it would, as no. long as he, I'm sorry. If, if they put a um, a ramp for a wheelchair mm -hmm. on the property, mm -hmm. um, sh shouldn't the owner also have the right to keep it? I think the current code allows us to do that. Yeah, right? we we certainly Sarah Young again. We certainly would not just because uh, someone uh, who got a reasonable accommodation was allowed to build a ramp per se, and then maybe they they move on. We're not going to put that property in double jeopardy that after they leave if the approval runs with, with the person and not the property, they would now have a violation. That, that's not the situation we intend to create. So we'll have to look carefully oh, okay. at, at wording. If that, if I understood, Reverend Whitley, your, your question, your concern. That's right. We're not okay. talking about ramps. <laughs> well, you can't 
Okay, any other comments that's not personal between two people? <laughs> if I may then, Mr. Chairman. You may. So we're not talking about ramps here. This is, that's an accommodation you don't, you wouldn't have to apply to build a ramp in front of a house. But people build ramps all the time without going to the Board of Adjustment or asking for permission. Um, but the chair is ready for a motion. Uh, well, be that as it may. Uh, you get to change the seating around. You don't get to, to limit the debate. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's really about uses, uh, about what you can do in the... In, as a, it's not about whether or not you can widen the doors. So you'd, uh, the, the, this isn't, doesn't run to the building code. This runs to the zoning code, right? This is making sure that there's nothing in the zoning code that prevents a person with a handicap from being able to use the property on an equal basis to the person who doesn't have a handicap. Uh, if you've got a building code problem, that's a different process and a different code. Commissioner Gibbs. I would tend to think that it could possibly include uh, some modifications. Uh, to me, this is, uh, it, if someone with a disability is turned down by uh, a landowner, uh, I, I'm not gonna rent to you because you have such and such disability. This is, to me, uh, an appeal for that. Uh, it, it, the, the property owner doesn't have to go to the Board of Adjustment to accommodate uh, a person with a disability. Uh, to me, this is more of an appeal if they need help. It, it, is that a fair assumption? Because it's, uh, you can't, the ADA already states you can't, uh, and civil rights already states you can't deny somebody uh, accommodation um, based on race, gender, all those other things, and disability. Uh, so this is more of an appeals process. That is. That's the way I understand it. Am I wrong? Yes, you're wrong. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to, to prolong the conversation, but it, the more I think about it, the, the more questions I have. But I do, in general, believe this is a help for the situation. It's not only uh, for the the landowner or the apartment or house owner and also the applicant. It, it gives them standards. That's all. Commissioner Bugsby. Hey, Mr. Chair, uh, I think we've had a, a robust discussion. I, I'm comfortable with this proposal. Uh, I'd like to move favorable recommendation on TC15 quadruple zero six, noting that there were a few uh, minor comments that staff recognize that they would work on. Yes, second. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask Mr. Busby if he would like, I would like to specifically list those uh, if we can. Yes. And so the, qu the way I wrote them down yes. is, is, okay. is these things. In uh, 3.24.2, uh, the word city needs to be changed to city and county or something appropriate to the UDO to recommend to to make sure that this isn't just a city only ordinance. That with regard to that same section, uh, Mr. Uh, Gosha's uh, comment that somehow it doesn't work very well, it starts off being a, a rule on who may apply and it finishes up as, w with having actually some, some, some grounds. I would like to see that split out. Um, I don't think that works very well and I agree with him on that. Uh, there was also the typo where we left out the word set and set forth. Uh, and then the final thing, uh, if everyone agrees, is I would like for there to be a sentence or a, a C in 
2.9 action by the Board of Adjustment, a statement that says that the accommodations granted are personal to the applicant and don't run with the land. I would second that. I disagree with that last one. We'll vote against it then. Okay. The amended motion. Yep. I, I'm comfortable with that motion and would accept those. So clarifications on the move. The, the motion states those minor changes have been defined, okay, and as he stated. Uh, so it's to move favorable TC quadruple zero six with reasonable accommodations with a favorable recommendation to the elected bodies. Roll call, please. Ms. Freeman. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Huff? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Mr. Kinchin? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Van? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Ghosh? Yes. Mr. Busby? Yes. Mr. Bryan? Yes. Mr. Whitley? Yes. Ms. Winders? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries 12 to 1. Okay. And next we have an open hearing on the technical change legislations. Uh, TC15 quadruple zero seven. Thank you again, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Uh, TC uh, 15007 are technical changes to the UDO to reflect uh, st statutes passed uh, by the recent session of the North Carolina General Assembly. Um, those statutes um, have been listed in your staff report and actual hyperlinks. Uh, and along with those statutes, a recent uh, court decision, Bird v. Uh, Franklin County. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, no one in the public wishing to speak, so we'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the uh, commissioners. Anybody? Okay. Okay, I got Linda. Linda, too. Okay, Huff, Gus, and Miller. Anybody else over here? Okay, Miller. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what is left of the Tuscaloosa Lakewood neighborhood overlay protection? I mean, does, does, how badly does this damage the program that that overlay set out? It, to me, it's a pretty substantial, there's just, it's like I, it's not hardly worth having. I, I would agree that it is a substantial uh, change to the overlay. Um, it does leave in a uh, number of landscaping provisions, uh, tree coverage provisions that are in there, and there are some uh, multifamily or non-residential provisions that uh, the state statute didn't touch, so we left those alone. But you're correct, it does do a significant gut job of that NPO. Mm -hmm. uh, and I realize that these that we only have one MPO and this is it, uh, and that the process has been uh, fraught with strife. Uh, I do think at some point we probably ought to revisit what's left. I'm not suggesting, and then and get the stakeholders involved to see whether or not, and look at the whole NPO thing and see whether or not with this design limitation, whether or not we've got whether there's another way to get at what we were we, what we were after, or whether or not we ought to perhaps just drop it out of the ordinance, since it's not going anywhere. Yeah, um, I mean the provisions that are left for Tuscaloosa Lakewood are pretty minimal. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't other opportunities for other neighborhoods to propose uh, an MPO that don't get into the design or aesthetics aspects to get into more of the massing or scale aspects of a neighborhood. Uh, we do have Old West Durham in, and I think they kind we haven't begun work on that yet. Um, that's, I think, being proposed as part of our work program. Um, but they so, get to the heart more of, more of what the state statute le lets zoning do, which is the massing scale, height, other, other dimensional standards, not the aesthetics. So you're getting to actually the, the bottom line of my question, which I was not getting to very effectively, is that even with this new legislation, that the MPO uh, still offers a, a, a very real program for specific neighborhood protection. And, and 
it's the, our ship isn't sunk. It, it could, depending upon the wishes of that neighborhood. Um, even when we did Tuscaloosa Lakewood, I remember at the beginning of that, they had a whole laundry list of items that the NPO couldn't even, at that point, reasonably tackle. Um, and we had to narrow that down. And then they did their own narrowing down when they developed their grassroots support for it. Um, they made a lot of compromises. But yes, um, there's still opportunities for viable NPOs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's all I have. Commissioner Goosh. I will recognize that I'm being nitpicky, but I'd like to think I was asked to do so. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> on, uh, on page six, uh, garages, access, and parking. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that necessarily everyone would agree, but it, um, on E3, it says, except for single family and two family residential structures, the construction material of the garage shall match that of the primary structure. It almost seems to prohibit the same for single and two family. Now, I know it doesn't specifically say that, but perhaps there is some wording that would make it more clear. Sure. That's a I can clarify. Yeah, I would say that you could leave it, the, the sentence the way it is, the construction, and then add another sentence and say this provision shall not apply to it. And then it. Yeah. It, it, Wait, I'll take a look at the structure of that and, so and clarify it. Sure. It Right, sure. right. So, I mean, that's, that's all I got. Sure. Uh, Thank you. Commissioner Huff. Um, I was a little bit uh, annoyed by the defined terms that were in here because what we have is a defined term, impervious surface, and then we are told to go look at NCGS 143, blah, 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 as amended. And I don't know why you can't actually put the definition in there rather than send somebody to code. And there's a second one of these definitions um, that's a dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's just not a definition. You, you're right. There are instances where it's better to write it out instead of relying on um, other statutes. But in this case, what is being done is trying to meld what our stormwater impervious surface built upon area um, standards and have them correlate with what the UDO says. So it's, it's aligning them. And the, the real fact is, and the same thing with um, built up, uh, with the dwelling unit, the state statute says that you can't have a definition that goes beyond what is within a uh, defined dwelling unit in some other state um, statute or or um, or code. Um, so, and the other problem is that those tend to change, um, particularly the built upon area uh, issue that has changed from session to session. Um, gravel, not gravel, a certain type of gravel, a certain application of that gravel. So instead of having the UDO have to constantly catch up, it's much easier in, in certain instances, and this is one, to just have it linked to that. It, it occurred to me that you could have a, well, I mean, this is, I guess, a definition section of the UDO. 16.3, uh, is that just definitions? Uh, Those are just definitions. Yeah. I, I just feel like something that, that, that's a little bit more um, specific ought to happen here. I would be very unhappy if I were a developer and, and was told to go look at these um, statutes. And well, I, 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 would, I would be comfortable in saying that most developers are pretty well aware of, of those requirements. OK. Anybody else? Commissioner Miller? So with regard to this, the categorizing uses, since we kind of had a case where that where the existing ordinance was deployed uh, with the Rose Garden, uh, Rose Business. Can you give me a, an example and walk me through how this new language will work? So um, you're talking about the Bird v. Franklin uh, yeah. amendment for categorizing uses, the last, the last part there. Right. Um, so currently, so let me get, if I'm, I'll give a little background. Um, the case basically said that the ordinance an ordinance cannot, if, if, if a specific use is not listed within your ordinance, you can't just say, oh, it's prohibited. You have to allow it. And our UDO says it's prohibited 
unless the planning director can come up with something that is, he takes a look at the existing, the, the list that's there and finds something that's reasonably similar. If he can't do that, then it's prohibited. We're getting rid of the prohibited part, leaving that first stage, and then sec that second stage is saying, okay, if he can't get to that specific similarity, he, should be, he or she should be able to get to a general category, the overall residential or overall commercial or something like that, and then apply the standards within, within there. So it's, it's just a two-tier uh, level of, of uh, without just a blanket approval. Mm -hmm. And that second, t that second stage would send it to the Board of Adjustment. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ready. Mr. Chairman, I uh, move that we send forth the uh, amendments embodied in, excuse me, let me get. TC quadruple zero seven. Yeah, TC one five quadruple zero seven. Second. I, thank you, with a favorable recommendation. It's been moved that we send with a favorable recommendation, uh, technical change legislation, TC one five quadruple zero seven to the elected bodies with the favor of recommendation. Roll call, please. Second by Busby. By Buxby. Mr. Gibbs. Uh, yes. Mr. Ghosh. Yes. Ms. Hyman. Yes. Mr. Busby. Yes. Ms. Huff. Yes. Mr. Bryan. Yes. Ms. Freeman. Ms. Winders? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Whitley? Yes. Mr. Kinchin? Yes. Mr. Van? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. The motion carries 13 to 0. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And before we do the uh, work program, would it be uh, appropriate for Ms. Winders to bring her? or her new item up in, in the work program session. Okay, so we will hear the presentation and then you can bring it. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, no, okay. yeah, you can do the presentation first. Okay. Because this will be an addition too. <laughs> All right, Sarah Young with the Planning Department. You have before you the department's proposed FY17, that's fiscal year 17, work program. Every year we are required by the interlocal agreement that formed the City County Planning Department to submit to the governing bodies, along with our budget, a proposed work program of all the activities that we will undertake in the coming year. As you know, the Planning Department provides a range of services, including a lot of ongoing legally mandated uh, development reviews. That is a large portion of our work program. However, there are a lot of discretionary type items in the work program as well. And what I would like to do is actually highlight those because those tend to be the things of most interest um, and in flux. So if you would indulge me, I will kind of walk you through the highlights for next year. Um, on page 11 uh, of 23, which is in the, in the Part B, the program descriptions, you will see item 3.2.3, .3, a patrol program. And this is actually uh, in our development side of the house under the zoning enforcement section. This is our new program to ensure that every street in the entire county jurisdiction gets patrolled a annually and hopefully multiple times. Currently, I don't know how much you know about zoning enforcement, but it functions mostly on a uh, complaint basis and so our staff resources are allocate to, allocated to deal with those complaints so this is a proactive effort by the department to reach beyond the complaints so that's one thing of note if you will flip to page 12 there under uh, section 4 our policy and urban design section 4.17 is a UDO text amendment for to rewrite the entire sign article and this is something that we actually propose to have done through a consultant because we have limited resources, however, we have identified monies in our budget to be able to hire a consultant to do this. This is in direct relationship to the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in the case Reed versus the town of Gilbert. Um, so 
uh, that will be uh, new and we will be managing that consultant to do that. 4.1.8 immediately below that is compact design district update for suburban stations and one, th one of the things that you will recall having heard staff say over the years is that while we have compact design district zoning that we are aware that when we place that zoning in some more suburban greenfield sites it's not necessarily going to work the same way and so we need to develop tweaks to deal with um, environmental conditions kind of master planning aspects of a large greenfield site and those are aspects that are not currently captured in our zoning ordinance so that would be the purpose of that amendment flipping to the next page page 13 towards the bottom um, and skipping over onto the top of the next page you have items 4.2.5.6 and 0.7 and before I talk a little bit about these I will say that one of the things that we're required to do is present our draft work program to the Joint City County Planning Committee um, that is a committee that your, your chair sits on along with three city council members and three county commissioners. And that is a body, it's basically our advisory body to the planning department that works through planning related issues. When we presented our initial run at a draft to them in January, I believe it was, um, or February, somewhere in there, uh, the main comment that we got back was a desire for us to move more aggressively with applying the design district zoning to the future uh, light rail transit station areas. And we had originally proposed one district to be initiated next year. They asked us what, it could, what, what would it take to do more, start faster, go further. So we went back to them this month with this revised work program proposing to initiate three, Patterson Place, Irwin Road, and Alston Avenue with the intent of initiating the final two the year following in fiscal year 18. That would give us time to do the, the tech, can the complete the current text amendment we have underway to do some um, refining, if you will, of our current districts and get the suburban one kind of underway and have regulations in place uh, for Lee Village when that one comes online. And item on the top of page 14, item 4.2.8, we are, we have partnered with uh, Go Triangle as well as uh, the town of Chapel Hill on an FTA grant for planning, TOD planning. Uh, there, the grant has a varied scope of work of which we are providing some in-kind services, planning services, so that is what that um, entails. It will also entail some consultant work to provide for us um, some additional, I guess, mileage on the SASE project, if you will. And wrapping up here, the last thing of note is on page 16. We have item 4.8, which is a community, uh, comprehensive plan community profile. We have long said that it is time to update our comprehensive plan. Uh, we have requested funding for that in the budget. Uh, I'm not sure, I have an inkling, but I'm not sure um, what the official disposition of that will be. However, we are anticipating beginning some background work um, to be prepared for the time when that is actually funded and can happen. And then item 4.10 on that same page 16 is uh, Andrew Driver Commercial Infill. This would be a project to apply the Commercial Infill Zoning District in that area to help kind of boost the revitalization there. That district, as uh, hopefully at least some of you will recall, relaxes a lot of zoning restrictions in uh, older, denser, more urbanized areas that maybe cannot meet many of our um, modern day more suburban type standards in an effort to help revitalize these areas so the intent is to apply that zoning there we have applied that at um, in the west chapel hill street corridor a handful of years ago and um, we intend to do that here and then this was alluded to earlier item 4.11 the old west durham npo which is something that has been um, submitted but honestly back burnered for lack of staff resources so uh, that is one that we are proposing to move forward as you can probably imagine, this is a fairly aggressive work program. Um, we are very hopeful that uh, the funding stays in place for the consultants to not just do the signs, but um, we're going to bring in a consultant to help finish out the SASE project this as well. This is the end of July, right? Right. So, yep. Um, next July. Next July. <laughs> yeah, not this July. We have the last year's work program that we're working on for this year. Um, but with that, I'll take any questions that you have. Okay, I see we have 
We have public comment? Okay. I will let Ms. Winders make her comment, and then I will have the public comment and then close the public hearing. Because I want you, you're going to speak to what she's talking about, right? Oh, it's different? Okay. Well, then, if you want to speak to this item, uh, I don't see. Mr. Hale. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Members of the commission, um, I appreciate these long meetings and uh, your service. Please state your that name goes, and address, please. I'm sorry. My please name is Dick you. Hales. I live at 809 Demarius, number K4 in Durham. Um, I'm a member of the Coalition on Affordable Housing and Transit. It was a community organization formed about three and a half years ago with a lot of different community groups involved. Uh, I think last count we were at 20. If you include all the groups that are part of CAN, it's uh, some 30 plus groups. Um, we've had a fairly narrow focus from the time we started. Uh, it was to try and be serious about putting more affordable and mixed income housing around the transit stations with this historical billion and a half dollars public infrastructure planned in the light rail system from Chapel Hill to Durham. And uh, two years ago, um, city and county both adopted a resolution, set a goal of 15% affordable housing at each of the transit stations. Um, and I think the role of the coalition since then has been try and take that seriously and look for opportunities to advance that, both in terms of resources available and opportunities to uh, move it forward. Um, with that in mind, um, We've had some dialogue um, with elected officials and the staff for the last six months in particular about some of the trade-offs between moving forward with the stationary plans and the up city initiated up zonings that will result like happened in the 9th Street area um, as opposed to allowing opportunities for the community to have dialogue with some um, higher density zoning requests that come through, such as the Farring Ro Farrington Road proposal that came before you a couple months ago. Um, and while in North Carolina and in Durham, we're not allowed to have inclusionary zoning, where affordable housing is required by the ordinance, um, we think that trying to encourage opportunities to have active dialogue between the community and developers and the elected officials as proposals come forward is a positive thing. Um, there's 20 units of affordable housing pledge by the Farrington Road um, development now um, in the city council approved conditions on that project. Um, we think that's not insignificant. We'd like to encourage those kind of discussions to continue. We think um, as a result, um, and I've helped put these work programs together before, so I certainly respect it's a lot of work and uh, there's a lot of great things called for from the staff, uh, the great staff for next year. But specifically, um, uh, and the coalition hasn't taken an official position on this, but we have discussed it generally, and I think they're supportive. Um, we'd like to uh, suggest that um, the, what we call the stationary plans, I know they have a different title with the staff, um, I recently had a meeting with Sarah and uh, Steve Medlin. Um, be pushed back a year um, and to, in order to give more time for more dialogue. Uh, another specific thing that the coalition's interested in bringing forward is a, a significant, uh, we feel, UDO text amendment that will provide significantly more incentives to provide affordable housing um, than what we have right now. Uh, the staff has brought forward a number of changes in the last year or two. We've applauded that, we've supported that, um, but we think there is at least one other option we'd really like to move ahead on uh, as soon as possible and which would um, perhaps be most effective during this period between the current situation and the adoption and upzoning around the transit stations in the years to come. Um, so because of that, we're suggesting that um, uh, there be a, at least a one-year delay 
be push, I guess, push back out of this work program. Um, sections 4.1.8 and 4.2, 5, 6, and 7 to delay the compact neighborhood design district update and the start of three station area plans. And we would propose in its place to add on to 4.1.9, which I believe is the SASE um, item to, um, uh, to support a city county initiated UDO amendment for affordable, affordable housing development option for station areas comp and the compact neighborhood tier. Um, we are actively working on trying to draft, get comments on, and bring forward um, uh, this additional text amendment that we think is very important. Uh, don't have it for you tonight, um, but we are offering this as a modification and a delay of the proposed work program, and we are planning on making this case to the Joint City County Planning Committee and others in the coming months. Um, one additional point, I've got two copies of this, I'm sorry, don't have one for everybody. Um, in the 2014 uh, resolution that was adopted by the city and the county to support f the goal of 15% affordable housing at all the transit stations, it called for special coordination efforts between city, county, and other agencies to try and make sure everyone's pulling in the same direction. Um, I think um, some members of the coalition feel like that hasn't been as strong a collaboration and coordination effort as it could have been. Um, so we are proposing to put in this work program uh, and it could very well be uh, modified by city and county managers if they would prefer to recommend something else. Um, um, at the direction of the city and county and the Durham Housing Authority this is in conjunction with Karen Lotto's, the city's housing consultant, recommendations um, of trying to start at coordination meetings among different city, county, and housing authority and other partners, um, and to also make that group responsible for overseeing <coughs> and implementing some of the new recommendations coming forward um, from the city's housing consultant. Um, I think we feel like we've been patient for two years. There are certain aspects of that adopted resolution that called for more of that to be happening than is. Um, I know not every department in city county have a work program, so we thought this was a good way by adding in the work program to get the issue out on the table, get some positive discussion on it, um, and hopefully some action. Um, so that was to add a new section to, to section 4.2.4 called affordable housing and station area strategic infrastructure planning. I know it's pretty technical, um, but um, we're trying to sort of avail ourselves of different opportunities on matters that come before public bodies to um, advocate for affordable housing in these important areas. Um, we only get one shot at this, and we're trying to uh, do what we can to help move things forward. Um, and Dr. Winders is a member of our coalition um, and uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, Dick, so you know the Joint City County Planning Committee is not meeting in May. Okay. Our next meeting is in June. Okay. Thank you. Okay, is no one else wishing to speak? So we'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners I see. Commissioner uh, Whitley, Commissioner Winders, Commissioner Miller, uh, who else was anybody else name? Brian, Gibbs. Okay, Commissioner Winders. Okay, um, what I wanted, I wanted to bring up another, a, a different topic, which I'm not, doesn't 
I'm not sure the it's work program. I'm I'm sure that it's budget. <laughs> it's so both. so uh, somebody have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it might be a little bit of work program, but I don't think very much. Uh, I would, would uh, like for us to talk about the uh, notification requirements. I think when, when in our training session uh, la last week, uh, you know, we heard about the state's minimum requirement, and then I think our local requirement is to go to property owners within the, the, of the affected property, I think, and then our local requirement is a little bit broader than that in that it, it uh, uh, includes a, uh, how, how many feet of the boundary? So for rezoning, it's 600 feet from the boundary, and for a plant, comp plan amendment, it is 1,000 feet. Okay. So, you know, we are, notif we are sending letters to all of the property owners uh, whenever there's a rezoning or a plan, uh, plan amendment who fall within that, that uh, area. Uh, but we're leaving, we're leaving out a lot of residents who are also affected by those, those um, about the, by the actions. Um, and I, the, um, uh, this has come up with the uh, Coalition for Affordable Housing also, that um, uh, we would like to see the notification change so that, so that um, there, uh, a notice went to the site address as well as the owner's address. And um, I know that there's some things have to be worked out about it because, I mean, that works fine for, for a single family, I guess, but if you have a big apartment complex with a whole lot of people, uh, you know, you might not have all the addresses or something. I'm not sure whether all the details would work out, but, the, but how the, the details would work out. But the point is, you know, we need to notify the residents in the area as well as the owners of the pro property. Okay, and you just take that as an advisement? You don't have to respond we to it. We have already right now. shared your request with the planning director. Okay. Well, I would like to have, see the, you know, have a reaction from the planning board <coughs> and not just be me, you know, and, and possibly have a motion about it. If I can address that, Mr. Chairman, I don't think it's practically possible uh, to notify tenants because Howard, how do you know? I don't find that, in other words, you create a, a legal requirement in the ordinance that I don't think the staff can fulfill, which then makes every case that comes before us on shaky grounds because of ineffective notification. Uh, the there is. There is, I'm not aware of any source out there that tells you where anybody's living at any given time, uh, especially with tenancies of a year or so, that information is always going to be substantially out of date. And if, if you put in the ordinance that says, I was a tenant and I lived here and I was entitled to get a notice and I didn't get it, so consequently that rezoning's invalid, uh, I just don't see that that as being particularly practical. Uh, I think Durham takes a liberal view with regard to notification uh, by expanding the, the radii that we use for notification, but I think to add tenants uh, is uh, for notification other than the signage that we put up. Now I suppose we could do a better job with signage, but the, any kind of, I would op op oppose any move to increase mailed notices to persons who are not uh, property owners, at least with property owners, we have a database through the tax records uh, that even that has, is frequently faulty. Uh, but at least that we've got statutory protection there. If we mail to that, we know we've done the, 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 what's required. I don't, to add to it, in my opinion, is, is, to, is to make everything uh, loosey-goosey. Since the statute says, uh, we, and as we learned in our proceedings, that uh, a challenge of a, zone, of a zoning action on, on uh, inadequate notice is what's going to put you in trouble the, f the quickest. Uh, I'm against it, actually. It, it's a beautiful idea. Maybe we could do better with signage so tenants who come and go, we could put up more signs. I've been to other jurisdictions where the signs have tons of information or they're actually placards where you have a sleeve and you can put in some text. 
uh, so somebody can go up and look at the sign and read what, what's going on, I wouldn't oppose that. Uh, but the notion of expanding mailed notice, in my opinion, is impractical, and I would vote against it. Commissioner Goosh? Yeah, I would echo uh, Mr. Miller's comments, and I would also say that there are, you know, to my knowledge, there are like five or six kind of like neighborhood groups that uh, in any rezoning that I've been a part of in Durham, we've had to notify them because they're on the on the list of people we have to notify. Those kinds of groups can, are able to spread the word more effectively. And, and I think what Tom's point is, is exactly what my concern would be expanding this, this uh, the, the mailing requirement, is that um, if, your, if your notice is ineffective, your, your zoning case is, is on shaky ground. So, um, you know, to the extent that we really cannot know at any given time who is living in an apartment, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's wise to require one to notify tenants. Property owners, yes, and I, and I think we are, our, our ordinance is effective. I mean, I, I would even argue that a thousand feet is a little bit too much, but, um, you know, I, I think we have an, uh, uh, an effective ordinance in that regard, and I think there are other mechanisms out there. We also, as Mr. Miller mentioned, we you know there's signs posted. I guess we could uh, consider beefing those signs up, but um, they're certainly noticeable, uh, and and do direct one. Um, you know, if one were interested or so inclined, you could look at the sign and figure out, oh, maybe I should look into this. Um, but I agree there probably could be more information on the signs, but I, I too would vote against any, you know, requirement that we be, that we require more mailing or mailing to tenants. Gotcha. Commissioner Huff. Um, I brought this up some time ago, and in fact, uh, the planning department, we, um, I talked to a person whose name I don't remember now in Carborough. Apparently Carborough does notify renters. Um, I don't know how they do it. I don't know, you know, what their mechanism is, but certainly in many of our cases, I feel like people affected by the rezoning don't know about it. And I don't think that's good. And I think if, if we had, uh, if we did beef up our signage, if we had signs that had a pocket in them with some kind of information, I think that would be extremely helpful. Um, and I can think of, you know, one instance where I think the developer would have profited from hearing what people in the next door rental property had to say about runoff. You know, it'd be nice if these people came to a public hearing and they said, you know, this is what happens when it rains. Whereas you don't get anybody, uh, you don't get anybody from these neighborhoods. You don't get any information. It's, I don't think it's good that these people don't know. Um, that's my thought. Commissioner Bryan. I also agree with Commissioner Miller and Commissioner Ghosh. Uh, it would be difficult, I think, to really do much more than we do now. And we also have the newspaper advertisements, and I'm assuming that we could also even have something on the departmental website about upcoming cases. What I wanted to do was, was raise a point that actually came up some years ago uh, as to why we have differing distance requirements between text amendments and rezoning cases when it seems to me that we ought to be able to agree on a single number for both. Uh, that did get suggested some years ago, and the planning director at the time was enthusiastically in favor of it, but the governing bodies apparently didn't care for it. So. <laughs> Would staff like to address that? Or? Mr. Chair, this is Scott Whiteman. It's my understanding that when we first started doing plan amendments, they were right about the time we adopted the comprehensive plan, they were kind of a shiny new thing and we thought they would be rare and kind of far-reaching and so we thought wider notification would be important but I think after a decade we can say that they're usually neither they're frequent and usually pretty focused 
No, I was referring to the distance of notification. <laughs> I answered a question. You'll have to give me that. Ask <laughs> <laughs> the right question. <laughs> a thousand feet is a long way. We get a we get a lot of people who call us like, "Why am I getting this?" And it's like, "Well, you're within a thousand feet." And then they start tracing it and like, "Wow, that's a long way away." So, six hundred feet is probably sufficient in my very very humble opinion. What's that? Attendance? Uh, the tenants? We have no reliable way to send notice to tenants. And I, I don't say this very often, but I fully agree with Commissioner Miller that, <laughs> <laughs> especially if it's a legal okay, requirement, a it could put us in, in a very tough spot. And we could have zoning changes overturned because we missed a tenant or something like that. Commissioner Gibbs. Well, just simply, I think we should make better use of the newspapers and, and not so much technology, but what everybody, everybody does, read the newspaper or watch <coughs> the news on TV and not just Channel 8. I mean, the more, ex the more people that are access or that access uh, regular TV, I doubt very seriously very many people besides those like us who are interested tune into Channel 8 and I have some more things to say to them about that too but Dick I appreciate your comments and you what your group does and Dr. Winders and this is just indicative of how I knew when this process started <clears throat> and I think everybody knew it was going to be a slow moving process uh, the first round of uh, community meetings, and you've heard me say this before, they were they ended up being mainly either gripe sessions or people were expressing concerns, legitimate concerns in some cases, of uh, what was going to happen to them. Uh, are you going to move me out? Uh, it so it almost seems like a second round of community meetings uh, and organizations like like yours uh, Dick uh, depend on them to help spread and spread the the word and intake information and pass it on because that that's it's going to be a teamwork and I wanted to ask, too, along the lines you mentioned. Uh, okay, Mr. Gibbs, be <laughs> before you start on that, let's finish what uh, Commissioner uh, Winders started. Let's okay. finish that discussion first before we go to. Okay, I just, I, I, I will just have, I got a question to ask about the okay. hous housing report. That's I, I give you an opportunity to do that. Sure. Commissioner Wines. I, I, um, I, I see your point, you know, about the uh, have it, uh, adding to ordinance requirements, and I possibly shouldn't have prefaced it with that, uh, but I think that, that um, you know, individual letters gets a lot more attention than, the, than for um, such, uh, for things like the um, compact neighborhood planning, there was all kinds of publicity uh, done to, uh, and yet people are still saying, we didn't, uh, how come I didn't, I didn't know about this? How come I, I didn't get in, involved? And I, I think that, that um, the, we, if you just sent a letter or a postcard to occupant, you know, at the site address, you know, it, um, it it would be quite doable and would would not have to be an ordinance requirement, but you need budget to do it, you know. Uh, so, um, but I, I think that um, uh, I would like, and maybe I don't want to direct attention away from the comments that we've had about parts of the work program because I, it's getting late and we, we do need to talk about that later also. So maybe we should, table the discussion <laughs> of a notification for for uh, the next next meeting but I think we we need some kind of strategy for uh, 
making the planning uh, meetings more inclusive. Okay, so let's now go to the uh, to the work plan, uh, Commissioner Bryan. Um, I got you in the queue, Mill. Thank you. A um, couple of things about the work program. Um, I'm looking at page two, the sort of the bullet list there, and this sort of pegs on to some comments that Commissioner Miller made earlier. We've got the Old West Durham Neighborhood Protection Overlay. Um, in view of the changes, and after looking at the changes that were had to be made to another neighborhood overlay, I'm wondering if, uh, and I don't want to slow Old West Durham down if they're eager to go, but I'm wondering if staff time might be better spent going back through and seeing exactly what can be done now with neighborhood protection overlays. Or you've talked some about design and things like that, but yeah. I, I, I think that maybe we need to redefine what can be done before we do any more. Well, I think we, we've been, Old West Durham has requested this maybe four years ago, so it's been a little while. Um, and they're fully aware of what's been going on in that city next door. Um, and we've talked to them since then to make sure that it, the NPO could still meet their goals even without the design restrictions. And I think in for those of you who know Old West Durham, it's, the houses are pretty small and the biggest issue is that the new houses are way bigger. So we can still use the NPO to limit size or FAR or setback or other height, those sorts of things, which can be agnostic on the design of the structure itself. So I think we certainly believe that because and they've been waiting patiently and are getting less patient that this is a good time to do that. Thank you. Um, I have another question. I just wonder if staff can sort of briefly comment on what Mr. Hales brought up because he's suggesting some changes and I want to hear what staff says. Sure, staff would love to comment. <laughs> um, and this is no surprise to, to Dick, we've, we've talked and he knows um, kind of our stance as a department. So um, the, the first thing uh, on that Dick mentioned was delaying the projects by a year, those three that were slated to start. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we basically got di direction from six individual elected officials through the Joint City County Planning Committee to actually do the opposite and accelerate. So I think that's kind of a, a moot point. If that is in fact what the um, governing bodies want, then they will approve the work program. Uh, the second item was he mentioned uh, doing a UDO text amendment to deal with uh, affordable housing and kind of this um, the notion that has been thrown out about an option um, to to develop the kind of an intermediary um, and we feel again we, we have talked uh, one of the things that I didn't mention earlier but hopefully you saw in your review is we currently have a design district update text amendment underway and one of the things that we're looking at doing based on the enterprise partners report and our consultations with um, Karen Lotto on that, is to see if we can, in fact, through that text amendment that we are working on currently in this fiscal year, uh, make some adjustments to how we deal with uh, density for the future light rail station, the uh, station areas um, that could kind of accomplish that. That is something that we're currently working on. We don't have to wait a year and, and hope to do it. Um, we had a meeting with her today, in fact, to get started on that work. So um, I, I would say that instead of delaying that to do some inter in intermediary measure, let's proceed with trying to figure out if we can implement what the consultant has actually recommended. Uh, and that is what uh, staff is proposing. Uh, on the last two points about kind of coordination and meetings and having a kind of an oversight group, um, I mentioned to Dick, Dick earlier that that's not really the purview of the planning department. Uh, affordable housing as an overarching strategy is the purview of the community development department and that is where this most appropriately uh, would would live there is um, in consultation with karen lato um, lato excuse me uh, she did mention that she expects to come on for a second phase of work with the community development department so that would be their purview to manage that 
planning department has a very small role in this kind of density bonus business, but beyond that, all of the other recommendations from her report are really the purview of that or department, and that's where it's most appropriate. So um, that is why there is no such item such as that. However, we will, of course, participate to the extent that um, it is required, necessary, or beneficial with community development as this progresses. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Whitley. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you just, Mr. Hill, I think she explained it, and I'm in strong support that we escalate, not delay. Um, developers are coming with projects and they want, they want to know um, what the rules are. Um, and to delay it when there are members here and, and um, city council and county commissioners that want to vote on projects um, to, uh, to add it in um, would be a uh, hindrance to development. So um, I'm with the city and county in wanting um, the rule set and that we know exactly what a developer knows exactly what he has to do when he comes to us with a project. Thank you. Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually have three things that I would like to be considered in the work plan for the coming year. Uh, at our, the city council will probably next month uh, approve the adjustments to the boundaries of the Irwin uh, LaSalle Com Compact Neighborhood District, which has that kind of rump on the other side of I-85 that's really a part of the 9th Street District. I would like to see a work plan bullet on, since we already have the 9th Street plan, we know what its zoning categories are, talk about having a uh, city initiated rezoning f of the area inside that rump area along Hillsborough Road, uh, which is right now a patchwork of, zone, of, of zones. I mean, how hard would it be to involve the community in a me meeting or two? And I think the proposal would be making it an S2 for pretty much the, the length of it. Uh, I don't see adding a new core over there. Uh, so uh, I would like to add that. Uh, one of the things that's worried me about the compact neighborhood planning for uh, Alston Avenue is when you look at these, you gave us a zoning context map in connection with that case last time, and I, you look at that whole East Durham area, both inside and outside the proposed compact neighborhood tier, what a mishmash of zones. It's almost like every lot. And to me, that is a symbol of long time sort of neglect. We haven't been treating that. Area. We've just been granting rezonings. And somebody wanted to rezone a lot, we rezoned it. And now it doesn't, there's no, it, there's no planning. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. I would like to have a review and see if we can sort out uh, and make a, what I would say is a, a level and a reliable regulatory environment for the rebirth of East Durham. Right now, I don't think you can get it if, if every lot's a different zone. That's just not good planning. So that's a bullet I, I would like to see. The other thing I'd like to see is do we have an affordable housing policy that spent, we spend a lot of time talking about, but it's not part of the comprehensive plan. I would like to see our affordable housing policy or some aspects of it moved into the comprehensive plan. So that was, sorry to interrupt, but that is actually the fifth or sixth item of last month's agenda was comp plan text changes that morphed that language into the comp plan. So that is moving forward to city council. Yeah, I, I saw it, but I, I, didn't, uh, yeah, I don't so think that that actually does it, does what I want to do, but never mind. We'll drop that one. And then before I give up the mic, Dick, could you come and answer a question? Because you've asked for a delay, and we have, I have actually been arguing to council that we ought to be doing more. Uh, I don't want to 
switch from that position. We ought to be moving faster on these things while they're hot and while we have people involved uh, before we have more Farrington Roads jumping in and saying, look, the council's going to make this is a this is a hot point. We're going to get in there and get in in front of it because uh, that happened at Ninth Street and the results were unsatisfactory. Uh, if we delay, I think we are inviting more of that. Uh, I would like to understand better what we would be waiting for. And I, I didn't get that from your presentation. What is it that that you that you guys plan to bring forward? Make me believe that 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 a delay is a good idea. I mean, I, th I think there's two main points that um, have hit us. Number one, the um, downtown plan and the Ninth Street plan and the subsequent city initiated up zonings mm -hmm. uh, have resulted in a lot of development, but not a single affordable housing unit. Right. And that's thousands and thousands of market rate units that have gone through. I really so don't. we're looking for something better than that. And number two, um, I think it's our general observation that as we've seen some projects come through, Irwin Terrace and, and Farrington Road and so on, um, those developers are coming in, working with staff, looking at the guidelines already in the ordinance for other areas, and they're applying them to these other locations that are in station areas. And while I, the ideal is to have a plan in place that gives you full guidance and it all laid out and you hand it to the developer when they walk in the door, from a practical point of view, we think the design guidelines are laid out, the density targets are laid out, and that developers can know what to expect. I think if you see what happened with the, with the uh, Wood Partners proposal, the, how that evolved and so on, I'm not sure if there was a plan in place for um, down there, it would have been that different. Um, I, I'm sensitive to the general charge of not taking a piecemeal approach but at the same time, some of these guidelines on density and design and so on are all throughout the ordinance. You see them around town. I realize that, but what are we waiting for? What, what, what's going to happen in a year that's going to make it better? This is what I don't understand. I know the problem. What's I, the solution I that you're proposing? I think there's a good chance of having, um, you know, three, six, eight, ten more projects such as Farrington Road come through and to work with staff with the design deadlines, d design guidelines and the density targets, and then to work with the community on a dialogue of providing affordable housing um, as part of their proposal. Now, why, can't, why can't we do that starting now? Though? Why do we have to start a year from now? Because if you start now, that moves up the um, city-initiated up zonings that follow those plans several years forward. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, I realize real, that. It's a reality That's, issue. It's not a planning issue. I, I realize that. It's going to move it forward, but, but what's, I don't understand what, it, what difference a year is going to make. Why can't we, as we develop the plans for, I mean, I went through the Ninth Street thing. We first developed a plan, and then we implemented the plan. Uh, if, if I had had the experience of Ninth Street when we did Ninth Street, I would have put a bunch of stuff in the plan would have insisted on it that, that we didn't do because I didn't know what was going to happen. But now, being armed, we can put in a bunch of policies because we have some experience now. We've certainly massaged some of these issues uh, uh, a lot over the last two years. I think that we can develop plans and what have you that would make it, and also uh, implementation measures with regard to the way these zones work. In other words, we don't the S2, the S1 that we have, or the core that we have at Knight Street, doesn't have to be the same one that we do for Alston Avenue. It doesn't have to be as big. See, I'm against giving. I've been arguing against giving away the zoning for years. Instead of making a great big core, which is end game uh, for the city initiated rezoning, I'd like to see the core in each of the. I'd like this plan to say, here's what the initial core should be. And then we designate these other areas that could be core if we meet A, B, C, and D, and one of them might be an affordable housing target. And so the developer will have to come in and say, we're over here, we want to expand the core uh, uh, into this area. And then we can say, well, we'll do it if you can show A, B, C, D, and D is the affordable housing component. I don't see why we have to wait a year to start planning that way. Yeah. Our, our argument is really not against the plan. It's against the city-initiated upzoning that will follow 
which will, will convey value um, to um, developers uh, without having had the community dialogue and possible additional affordable housing resources offered up. And those are substantial. Farrington I, Road all by itself, we're talking Well, in my opinion, the, the approval dollars. of Farrington Road means that we ought to just give up on a compact neighborhood in that area. Uh, we've already, we just approved it. Uh, it's sucked up all the resources. It means what's left to plan is, is not much. Uh, but, but, but again, I don't think they, what they're proposing in the work plan is leaving the community out. Uh, and, and I don't think the work plan means that, that, that the resulting uh, three uh, design districts are going to come up with are going to be mirror images of Ninth Street. I hope that they will not be. Right. Not that I am totally unhappy with what happened at Ninth Street, but certainly we're going to learn every time we do these. Uh, it, it, I have very specific ideas about how these plans ought to go forward, uh, and I hope maybe we can have some dialogue about that. But you're talking about the, the problem of giving away the zoning, and I, I don't see why we have to give away the zoning if we're smart enough to say right now that's a problem, why we're going to be smarter a year from now. I just don't understand what, what we're going to get in a year. So if I may, it may help. While the work program proposes to initiate, to begin those three, it takes, um, we're at best case, we're talking three years, and depending on the amount of community concern, et cetera, that may happen through this. You may be looking five years before you actually get a rezoning on the ground. That is ample time to work out whatever we need to work out. And like I said, we're currently willing to work on it in the text amendment that we have live right now. So that is kind of the, the staff's stance is, this is not something because it's in the work program that it will be adopted at the end of next year. That is not how this works. There is a ton of community engagement that happens and honestly, that is the part of the whole process that takes the longest, that eats up the most amount of time. For those of you that, that were with us through um, the implementation of downtown and 9th Street, those were not for the faint of heart. Those took a long time. And when we, when we finally came here- I made we, 9th Street as painful as I possibly could. You sure do, you excelled at that, Tom, thank you. Um, but I think in the end, the product was better because we had more or less community support for what, what was brought forward, minus a few details. And that is always staff's intention when we bring a large project forward, is to have built community support and have uh, revised our proposal along the way to garner that kind of grassroots feeding of the project. So this is not something that would go live in a year. Commissioner all. Winders. Well, um, I, I, would, I think that what I would like, what Dick is talking about, if it's gonna take five years before we get to the rezoning, this idea for, uh, for um, um, having an option, an option where people, for residential development, where you can get extra, like up to compact district level zoning, uh, at c conditionally, y you can zone at the current zoning, I mean, you can build at the current zoning, which would be a maximum of 60, uh, I mean, a maximum of 20 units in the, in the uh, suburban tier, or if you take this buy right option or something, you know, you, you could get maybe up to, to, to 50 or more uh, density, provided that you uh, included affordable housing, you know, uh, as, an, an, an option that will work until you do the, the major rezoning. But then when, when, uh, when the design districts take over, then th that option would no longer be attractive and everybody would use the design districts instead. As, uh, um, that if, if it's gonna be five years, it would definitely be worth working on that sort of interim thing because it wouldn't be, you know, he's done most, he's done a lot of the work for it, you know, it wouldn't be a big, uh, um, it, it wouldn't be a big item <laughs> that we, to add that in, you know. Uh, and I think that was one of them, I, uh, is that on our list here, Dick? Is that how to add, you know, you, 
I can't say it well, but uh, to add working on this option, is that uh, this um, conditional option or whatever it is, what, what, we had a name for it now. You had a name for it. I think we've been calling it the transit oriented development development option. Not okay. conditional and not overlay. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and maybe Sarah knows more about this than I do, but uh, my impression is there's a lot of work left to put this in place, a lot of vetting of a lot of folks. And uh, uh, if you can get it done by June, we'll be very happy. But um, we think there's a there's a lot of work to go. That's why we suggested it be so is that added what, to the uh, work plan for next year. Is that what, what Sarah, you were talking about? No. Um, no. No. What Dick is talking about is, a, if I understood from our conversation the other day, is an option under current zoning where you could get essentially a density bump. Staff's mm -hmm. concern with that, quite honestly, is if you can get a density bump without having to comply with all of the the form and character standards and all of the other things that we're trying to implement to build a pedestrian friendly actual TOD environment, you know, we're going to get an onslaught of people that are going to come in and try and take that option now before all of the um, sticks come into play with the design district zoning. One of the things that uh, staff's tact has been, if we can get the compact neighborhoods in place and change the future land use designation to design, um, that gives the council a very real and very clear reason to say, mm, you're rezoning to whatever is not consistent with the future land use, therefore it, it is denied. And so it gives them a much cleaner way to kind of put the type of development that may not be desirable at bay while we work on the long-term picture. So I don't, I don't know if design, they will in fact apply it that way, but that is and your design, logic. your design district um, uh, changes text amendments that you're working on uh, which in a couple of items, uh, 4.1.5 mm -hmm. design district update. Is that going to include affordable housing as part of the design district? That is our intent, yes. Okay. That is what we are attempting to work with uh, enterprise partners on. Okay. Um, so then this design district is is um, uh, if, if we changed in the compact neighborhoods to uh, designate it as design district, then the design district that they would be able to change to would have an affordable, uh, right, a the, better, the whole conversation about we don't have anything in place would be moot because we would have something in place. Okay. That's the goal behind it. Okay. Um, Again, assuming I want to caveat this, and even um, Karen Lotto will tell you this, assuming that once we do the analysis, it is actually worth it to put that sort of bump there. She was very careful in her report to kind of caveat that she's not convinced that it's a done deal, that it'll work, or even that it'll work the same in every area. It may work for some, it may not work for other, you know, we just have to see. So I just want to carefully caveat that we're more than willing to go through the exercise and try and figure it out, but we don't know what the answer will finally be. So. Commissioner Gibbs. Oh, I thought you were going to do it. And then the other thing um, about the stationary uh, infrastructure planning, you know, I would argue that the, that, uh, the city's housing goal for, uh, requires not just the community development department, but also the planning department because, um, and, and I, see, I think it comes, it will come in uh, we, we need to do sort of compre little comprehensive plans for, the, for, the, for each of the design districts. And uh, we need to know where that affordable housing is going to be. And we, and we need to, we can maybe incentivize it with infrastructure and as, as well as through, through zoning. So, you know, it should be part of this, as Dick said, it should be part of the, the SASE process. So I, I will honestly beg to differ. The, the SASE, the, the Stationary Strategic Infrastructure Plan, is just about the infrastructure. Now, how that is applied as a tool going forward after the study is complete, if the city wants to use that uh, as an incentive of where infrastructure is needed and where potentially they want to see some development happen of a, of, that includes affordable housing, they can do that. But the study itself is really about assessing where are the needs, where are the gaps, what are the needs precisely. How that tool gets applied afterwards, that could be a, a variety of ways. So I don't want to tie that. I feel uncomfortable tying that just specifically to housing. 
but density uh, is related to the needs, you know, and there's a decision, you're making decisions on density, and that uh, re uh, relates to the needs for infrastructure. It also relates to, I mean, if you're not. Commissioner if Freeman, you're using, please wait and get in the queue. I just wanted to please make sure. Please wait and get in the queue. That, that would please wait and get in the queue. To please wait and get in the queue. I yield, I yield my. <laughs> well, Commissioner Gibbs is the next speaker. I just wanted to comment on her comment. Commissioner Gibbs is the next speaker in the queue. Uh, well, my comment uh, is uh, <clears throat> Karen Alato's, uh affordable housing report. I, I don't know <clears throat> how many of you have read it or looked at it, but the Durham area designer sent me a link to that. and. <clears throat> and this is very apropos and supportive of what you were just talking about. It's not going to happen overnight, and it's not going to happen the same everywhere at all these stations and everywhere else that some compact neighborhood may be. Uh, it's about, what, 200 pages? It's pretty substantial. It's, uh, I started reading it, and I got so frustrated. And if you... If y'all would like, if you haven't seen it, I'll be glad to send uh, a copy or forward the email to all of you. It's uh, very eye-opening, and I understand now why it may take years before things can be settled and, and we can, like Dick was saying, <clears throat> put it in the guidelines so that each developer knows exactly what he needs to do and I and I'm sure that the hub and concentric circle design that that you've been referring to Mr. Miller is that that's probably the way things are going to evolve but I, I just wanted to be sure that everybody got a look at and and you'll see what we're up against and what all the entities involved in fair fair housing uh, and affordable housing. It's, uh, like I said, I got frustrated after a few pages. Very in-depth. Commissioner we Bugsby. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I think the, the staff already addressed my main issue, which, but I do think it's worth pointing out. When you look at the three compact design districts that are in this work plan, the deliverables are the issue identification and the first public meeting complete by the end of fiscal year 2017. So that is 16, 17 months from now, the first public meeting. So we are still just slow walking this process. Uh, and I appreciate the, the concerns and I share the concerns about the need to adequately address affordable housing. I would agree with uh, Commissioner Miller. I think we need to move forward with this process or else we may find ourselves in a position where there isn't going to be a need to do any of this work, that, that we are dealing with one by one these proposals coming in. So I think it's important, number one, that we, we do move forward. But I do think there, you've raised an important point, which is there is a key point in this process where we need to have the public input, which will happen with, with the staff working very diligently on this process to make sure that we think carefully about up zoning as we're looking at these design districts. But I think that will come in this process. So I, I, I think we need to move forward. Uh, and, and I agree. I actually appreciate that the elected officials have said, let's do more of these. Because my concern is, if we don't get this moving now, again, we're having decisions happening right now that are starting to make the decisions without being this thoughtful about the process. So I, I'm going to support moving this forward because I care about affordable housing and because I do want to see us make progress on that issue. So thank you. Commissioner Freeman. I think I initially felt the same way, but speaking to, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, Hale. Mr. Hale, um, Mr. Hale's comment, uh, moving forward fast doesn't solve the problem. We're not even talking about the problem. So if we're doing a SASE study and we're not looking at income, it's going to be a it's going to be a, a missed opportunity to to provide the information that's going to be needed for an affordable housing plan, or a compact 
a comprehensive plan where affordable housing can be addressed. So this, similar to my point earlier in saying like, it's not just station areas, it's also, I mean, in the county, people are gonna be displaced by the decisions that we make here. And if we don't stop and think about what we need to do in order to avoid that, then it's gonna happen. And you can, you can claim unintended consequences, but it's not unintended if you keep speeding through it. And that's all I'm gonna say. Okay, I have a couple of questions with right to the first thing you mentioned, patrols. Mm -hmm. uh, are you talking about what the zoning enforcement officer controls, patrols? Yes, zoning enforcement patrols. And you're gonna hit every street a month? Are you adding additional staff to do that? I know Patrick is, he's good, but I don't know if he's that good. <laughs> 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 yes. No, we are not uh, proposing additional staff to do that. We're proposing a restructuring in how that group kind of does its work. Um, ah. You know where they go ahead to yeah. stop taking such a long coffee break, huh? Okay, I'm sorry. No more, uh, no more four hour lunches. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second question was signage. Mm -hmm. Explain what you, I, I know each department you have you know, they, they do these, bring these specialists in and, and they go over signage and why can't the city just pay $150,000 and, and, yeah. and develop a, uni, a uniform, uniform signage throughout the city and county? So a, a couple of things. One is this effort to divert enough staff resources to work on implementing the, the compact design districts, which we do not feel comfortable um, should be done by an outside consultant because we feel like there needs to be folks that understand kind of the community and the history and where we've been and what we're trying to do and all that. So part one was an effort to redirect live staff resources to that effort. However, the sign article business is something that really needs to happen. Um, we are not, although Mike is excellent with the text amendments, and we do have an excellent attorney's office. None of us are constitutional attorneys, and this is a constitutional kind of issue dealing with speech that is really not our bailiwick. So we felt that that was an easy switch to say, okay, we could bring someone in to, to fill that, that niche that we don't really, we cannot fill, and, and have the bonus of allowing the staff resources to be moved to this other effort that we can fulfill. Does that help? Yes, Commissioner Freeman. So I, I noted um, before I got all <laughs> turned around with that <laughs> sassy. Um, there was a neighborhood uh, outreach. It was listed as num like number five, or is it nine? I'm sorry, community outreach. Mm -hmm. And then the customer service and engagement. Is this numbering like listing in order? I just wanted to. What do you mean in order? So, like, this is the fifth area. Is it just area? Is it just by the list that that's on page one and two? Is this okay. list by priority or is it just yeah. okay? And then just noting that the community listening sessions, mm -hmm. if we could make that a huge priority, I think that the that would address what what um. Yeah. So I can talk about that very briefly. Um, one of the things that. Um, we really tried to implement this year, couldn't get completely off the ground just because of, of lack of time, but it is our intent to move forward with is usually we do a lot of community engagement when we have specific projects, right? Hey, we've been given some directive to do X, let's go ask the community around X about what X should be, okay? What we do a really bad job at is just asking in general to the community, hey, what should our projects be? What are some community issues that you see that you want addressed? Um, so this community listening sessions is intended to be kind of that bigger, kind of broader input that could be done earlier in the year to help inform when we put together our proposed work program. Um, are there things that maybe are not in the forefront of our thinking, but we've heard 
uh, enough community concern about that we should address. Um, so currently, we don't have a venue to get that kind of broader input, and we would like to put that into place. And then I also wanted to add that I know that the current budget is around seven, or the requested budget was around seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Is that right? for for the planning department as a whole? <laughs> Can't give me a number. Okay. Yeah. All right. But I, I just wanted to make sure that we we would really push to um, support the staff's request or the department's request for the budget to be um, accepted and. Um, it's, um, it's really important that because we've been pressuring them to do more and they've actually laid out a plan to do more that we actually support them with the needed funds that they've asked for. As you can imagine, our budget is personnel heavy. We don't produce widgets. We provide a professional planning service. So the majority of our, we don't have, we have relatively very small operating expenses, um, except for things like notice, et cetera. Um, but uh, we, the majority, the vast majority, like 90 some percent of our budget is personnel expenses, people to do the, until we like to think intellectual work um, for the community. But I it's got, important. I, got, I heard that laugh back there. Did you guys hear that laugh? That was <laughs> anyway. So, and yeah. I want to thank you for putting that community listening session in there. It really says a lot about listening to the community. Thank you. Concept. All right. We finished with this item. Mr. Chairman, if it's the appropriate time and if everybody's had an opportunity to speak, I would like to make a motion. You may. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we send forward the uh, fiscal year 17 planning department work program to the city county, the city council and the board of county commissioners um, with a recommendation for approval with two additions. One is to uh, include- Speak into the mic. Pardon me. One is to include uh, a city-initiated rezoning for the that portion of the uh, Irwin Road compact neighborhood uh, uh, that is north of I-85 uh, to rezone that uh, consistent with the uh, uh, zoning categories in the Ninth Street compact neighborhood <coughs> tier and design district. And then the second item would be uh, to initiate uh, a review with a view to propose uh, city-initiated rezonings in East Durham to resolve what I call uh, an inconsistent patchwork of, of zones. Uh, this would be outside the proposed Alston Avenue uh, compact neighborhood tier. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Miller, second by Commissioner Freeman, that we move uh, physical year 17 work program uh, with a couple of additions that was stated by Commissioner Miller. Roll call, please. Mr. Bryan? Yes. Mr. Busby? Yes. Mr. Ghosh? I would like to note that I do not have any uh, form in my packet to vote on this item. My vote is yes. Vote. You can vote verbally. It's not the decision. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, Mr. Ghosh, yes. Mr. Gibbs. Yes. Miss Hyman. Yes. Miss Huff. Yes. Miss Freeman. Yes. Mr. Harris. Yes. Mr. Kinchin. Yes. Mr. Miller. Yes. Mr. Van. Yes. Mr. Whitley. Yes. Miss Winders. Yes. Motion carries 13 to zero. Okay, before everyone decides to get up and leave, uh, Mr. Miller has an item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in view of the information that was given to us today about uh, the departure of Amy Wolf, uh, I was wondering whether the Commission thought it would be appropriate to adopt a resolution of thanks uh, and good wishes to her. Uh, the Planning Commission uh, does not actually have intersection with all the members of the planning staff and they are all valued and they come and they go. But Ms. Wolf, I view as a special case, it, certainly for as long as I can remember and all the time that I have served on the Planning Commission, uh, she has been a steadfast supporter of the work that we do. 
I know it was her assigned job, but nevertheless, she has done it well. And I would like for us to consider and adopt a resolution tonight so uh, this item doesn't wait until we uh, meet again after she's left. Um, and so I have actually scratched together uh, the resolution, and if you want to hear it, I will read it. It is read fairly it. brief. So this would be a resolution by the Durham City County Planning Commission in appreciation of the service of Amy Wolf. Whereas the welfare of the people of the city and county of Durham depend in no small measure upon the professional knowledge and hard work of the members of its planning staff, and whereas Amy Wolf of the planning staff has during her years of service with the planning department exhibited a high degree of professionalism, patience, and good humor excuse me, in her service to the development community, government officials, and ordinary citizens, and whereas Ms. Wolf has served the planning commission with her careful review of and thoughtful reporting on hundreds of rezonings, plan amendments, and other development proposals, and whereas the planning commission has come to rely on Ms. Wolf's service for the quality of its own work. Therefore, be it resolved that the chairman and the members of the uh, Durham City County Planning Commission hereby express to Amy Wolf its heartfelt thanks and its best wishes to her uh, for the future. That's my motion. I'll second that. It's moved and second that we um, present this resolution to uh, planning, senior planning, uh, planner uh, Amy all those in favor of that please by raise their right hand it's unanimous and you gonna type it up or you gonna give it to give it to sis okay two announcements <laughs> along with you have what's what's coming up next month so we have next month, we, in addition to Nor North Roxborough Retail, which was deferred from this month to next month, we have, um, it looks like one, two, three, four zoning cases and one plan amendment case. Okay. So a total of five zoning cases and two plan amendments. Okay. Would you speak to the planning academy? The, I cannot speak to the planning academy, but Ms. <laughs> Young might be able to. I'm, I'm very, very small familiar with it. Sure. <laughs> So Planning Academy is again one of our additional outreach efforts that was begun this year. It is intended to be a follow-up to um, Neighborhood College. Uh, so if Neighborhood College is kind of the 101 course, mm -hmm. this is the 200 level course. Mm -hmm. um, it's currently designed as a series of uh, three sessions. Uh, I think one week apart basically where people actually will have homework, but hopefully that won't, people won't shy away, where folks will get a more in-depth kind of um, look at planning related stuff you know how decisions are made um, they will do things like run a mock planning commission meeting where they will review a case and sit in here like you all do and kind of take them through uh, the legal requirements that we have to go through um, what certain things I'll mean my, in right in more depth um, the idea being that uh, as people get more comfortable with these things, they're better informed, they can help their friends and neighbors and communities better understand and better participate in the public process um, related to planning. So the first uh, academy is slated to run at the beginning at the end of this month into the beginning of May. Um, we are limiting seats to 24 at a time so that people can actually uh, you know, I interact with each other and keep the group size kind of manageable. That one is full. We have planned a second one. The second one is full and we're now at a waiting list for the third one which is yet to be scheduled. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Chairman, Aaron Kane told me that within seconds of posting it, they had, they filled it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a great thing. And he wanted to get one under his belt before and get the bugs out of it before they uh, uh, got too deeply involved in, in scheduling too many more. I think it's an excellent thing. Yeah. I am really pleased. Yeah, this, yes, so this am hopefully I. will give us a or kind of our long-term vision is that these folks may be these I don't know, certified or whatever could be ambassadors then we could call them back if we need you know steering committee representation for something right. from certain areas it could give us also a pool of people to help kind of get the word out and get involvement in projects so we see it as a, a big plus and the second uh, the last year we submitted a resolution for a thousand dollars for each of the elected bodies for our training 
and the director has submitted that again this year. So I, I don't know when those classes are in, in Chapel Hill, but it, so if you would like to get additional training, we should have, hopefully we'll have budget for you to do that. So uh, I think I'm supposed to come up with an application process for you to apply and uh, so I, I, I'll work on that. Uh, but hopefully the money is there, so if we want to be trained, we can, at the city and county's expense and not ours. <laughs> and is there anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, do you have, I uh, understand you were going to have some copies of <clears throat> the training session we just had for? Yes, you're absolutely right. I do have them at home. Okay. <laughs> I, I looked at the past I said, what in the world is this? You know, so I put it in. Uh, but yes, I, I do have uh, the extra copies for the people that weren't there. It's two. The two of you weren't there. Yeah, not, Everybody else. Yes. I do have one last thing. I received an email that the um, county is trying to put together a, a PowerPoint presentation for a celebration they're having later this month, and that if I could get a picture of the board, would y'all would y'all let me just snap a quick picture on my iPad of you guys? Do you mind? Yeah. Can well, we, we do? I mean, after you adjourn, can we meet like out there in the lobby and we'll do it out there real quick? Is that? Is I, that okay? I think you have better lighting in here. Well, it's, Susan took your name plates down. If you stand right in front of here, yeah. that would be good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, after you adjourn, okay. I want to do that. Not until the picture's taken. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Yes, we are currently in adjournment. <clears throat>